Hey, good morning or afternoon, everybody. If I could, I'd like to call the meeting to order um, and pass it over to our corporate officer to uh, undergo the election of uh, chair and vice chair. Thank you. So as this is the first uh, meeting of the utilities committee, we will carry out the election of chair and vice chair. So nominations will be called three times as candidates are nominated. They will be asked if they consent to the nomination and then nominations will be closed. If there's only one consenting candidate, that candidate will be acclaimed as the chair or vice chair for the vice chair election. If there are two or more consenting candidates, each candidate will be given a few moments, uh, two minutes to say a few words if they wish before the ballots are distributed. So I will now call for nominations for the office of chair. Thank you. Director Houghton. I'd like to uh, nominate Director Michael Grenier. Director Grenier, do you accept the nomination? Yes, I do. Thank, Thank you. you. Second call for nominations for the office of chair. Third and final call for nominations for the office of chair. I declare the nominations closed for the office of chair. Director Grenier is acclaimed to the office of chair for the utilities committee. Congratulations, Director Grenier. Before I turn the meeting over to Chair Grenier, I will now call for nominations for the office of vice chair. Direct, <laughs> Director Onslow, do you accept the nomination for the Office of Vice Chair? Thank you. Second call for nominations for the Office of Vice Chair. Third and final call for nominations. I declare the nominations for the Office of Vice Chair closed. Director Onslow is acclaimed to the Office of Vice Chair for the Utilities Committee. Congratulations, Director Onslow. I will now turn the meeting over to Chair Grenier. We have some things to talk about, and uh, how would you like to proceed, staff? Do you have the agenda? Do you have yes. the agenda in front of you? So you just follow follow right. the agenda. Excellent. We should so have some minutes. We have the acknowledgement uh, to begin with. Uh, TNRD acknowledges we connect with uh, many First Nations communities across our vast region, regional district, and today uh, we're located on Tecumseh Sequatmec uh, territory, situated within the unceded ancestral lands of the Sequatmec Nation. Uh, the TNRD appreciates the partnership that we have with Tecumseh Sequatmec and uh, respect the territory and land on which we gather today. So we've uh, completed the election. Uh, we'll go on to the minutes. And uh, I guess, uh, do I need a, uh, we have the minutes from the October 5th, 2022nd meeting. Uh, was anybody here from that meeting? I don't think so. Anyways, we have to adopt some minutes. Is there any? Uh, uh, do I have to ask for a table of that? Just a mover and seconder. Okay, so uh, uh, Usoff uh, and, and Lee. Thank you. Uh, all in favor? Opposed? Okay. Um, and uh, so uh, is there any amendments to that? Uh, those, I guess we should have had a question about the amendments to the min minutes. No amendments? Okay. All right. So the minutes are behind us uh, at this point. Uh, reports. We have Utility Service Committee and Department Overview and Background. And uh, so this is uh, uh, Jamie. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first 
of this utilities committee meeting. Um, and uh, as we just mentioned, when you're adopting the minutes, everyone on this committee is new, uh, all newly elected uh, electoral area directors. Uh, so to start off, I'm going to do a quick overview of the uh, just the committee terms of reference. So they are attached to the agenda. So membership is uh, eight TNRD directors and those representing areas that have a TNRD owned water system. So this is actually a change that we made uh, just this past uh, summer when we did uh, TNRD wide committee review uh, and amended the terms of reference uh, to only TNRD directors that had an, uh, a system. Previous to that, um, this committee was made up of also municipal representation and some electoral area directors were not on this committee, even though they had water systems. So that change has been made. Uh, meets, this committee will meet twice a year or um, additional meetings can be called by the committee chair and the chair and vice chair are two year terms. Uh, this meeting is open to the public unless it's closed for a specific reason under section 90 of the community charter uh, and minutes will be recorded. But I wanted to clarify for this meeting in particular, um, as you'll see, uh, this is a really um, probably our most kind of operational based committee where we're really going to get you into the weeds of the day to day operations and the capital uh, updates on on each individual water system. And so what we found in the past was that there was a you know very detailed text heavy reports and then we turn those reports into PowerPoint presentations. Um, and then a uh, recommendation we made that the committee approved was instead of doing the written reports that we just turn the PowerPoints into um, attach those to the minutes. And so that's what we'll do. So you won't see very many written reports of this committee unless there's a specific actual recommendation we want this committee to move forward to the board. Typically, the information updates will be done through the present PowerPoint presentation. So everything you're going to see on the screen today will be attached to the minutes that go out following this meeting. Uh, mandate of this committee, uh, so it's to provide advice and or recommendations to the board related to ongoing strategic operations and development of the utility services, and those are specifically the ones that are owned and operated by the TNRD, policy issues related to our, our utility services, or other matters referred to this committee by the board of directors. So what that actually looks like, uh, kind of what to expect on this committee. Uh, on a regular basis, uh, at each meeting, we will give an update, both an operations update and a capital update for each of our 13 uh, utility systems. Uh, and your role as committee members is to assist in communicating correct information to residents uh, through the board to lobby to higher levels of government for issues which you'll be aware of, you know, through the term of this, uh, this meeting, be aware of a number of challenges that we face. So it, it lobby to higher levels of government around those issues. And I also just want to point out that all, all these systems, there's 13 systems, and I recognize that each person in this room has either one or multiple systems in their area. But as this committee, your mandate is um, to make recommendations to the board for any and all of those committees. So um, each, sorry, all of each, any and all of those systems, all of those 13 systems are the responsibility and liability of the TNRD board as a whole. So uh, specifically, you as a member of this committee, the expectation is that you're going to be familiar with and engaged with all of these systems, not just the ones in your electoral area. Uh, another role is that you'll uh, review and update bylaws related to utilities, so things around water restrictions, user fees, like our rates bylaw. Um, also have uh, discussions around prioritizing projects for grant applications or uh, other funding for capital projects. Discussion around policies related to utility systems, and I'll give you an update on our, our existing policies uh, shortly. And any major operational changes will also come forward to this committee. Any questions on the terms of reference before I jump into sort of a overview introduction of the department? All right. So our utility services department, six full-time staff. Um, so I guess maybe I should have introduced them right at the beginning. So sitting on my right and my left, Tyrone McCabe is our manager of utility services. 
and Mick Horton is our supervisor of utility services. Uh, so they're our management team, and uh, we have uh, four staff that a full time staff that work out of this yellow building here in Mission Flats. And these two gentlemen are based there as well. We also have three casual TNRD uh, staff that we'll bring in uh, as needed to fill in for vacation, sick leave, or, or a special project, that sort of thing. We also have four contract operators. Operators, so they're not TNRD staff; they're they're, they're contracted workers, but uh, they perform a lot of the same duties and functions as our our in in house uh, TNRD staff. And those are live within those communities. So generally speaking, the areas where we have the contract operators are the ones that are the further drive away from Kamloops. The ones that are closer within Kamloops, you know, within the hour drive or less, are the ones that are staff based here in Kamloops uh, uh, service. So as I mentioned, Tyrone and Mick are here, and uh, the, the four staff that work under them are Ken, Dale, Darren, and Keenan. Uh, so we have a lot of years experience here. Ken, Dale, and Darren have been here 15 years plus. Yeah, and Keenan's been with us for a couple of years. Uh, so Tyrone is going to go into more detail around the utilities department and, and what they do kind of on a day-to-day -day basis, but a sort of a high-level crash course, if you will, is uh, the overall budget uh, for the department is $1.9 million. That is funded uh, differently. Keep in mind that, that these services are funded differently than the majority of TNRD services that are funded by general taxation, whereas these services are funded primarily through user fees. But we also have parcel taxes that are applicable to uh, the properties within the area that fund as well. Now, that $1.9 million, that's the total budget, but each, thir each of the 13 systems is a separate standalone budget on its own. Uh, the operating costs are primarily our labor to operate these systems on a daily basis, as well as repairs and maintenance. Smaller capital projects are sometimes funded through kind of our reserves or taxation, but generally speaking, most capital projects require grant funding. And we're going to go into deep dive in the kind of the financial status of the systems uh, later on in this meeting. Uh, we hire contractors for most of our capital projects, so we don't do um, any significant capital projects under our own uh, manpower, and that those are almost always awarded through a public, public tender process. They're usually larger projects that are triggered that public tender through our, our delegation and purchasing policy. Um, I also wanted to point out we have a contract uh, with True Consulting here in Kamloops for engineering services. So up in, and this is fairly new, this actually just was approved by this board in November. Uh, up until this uh, long-term contract with True, we would do a public tender process for engineering services on a case-by-case -case basis for specific uh, capital projects in specific systems. Uh, but we found that there's going to be, uh, a, and we're already seeing the benefit to this, having a regular uh, engineering team devoted to our systems. So there's not as much time getting up to speed, understanding our systems that they already are very familiar with it to move forward. Um, and also with um, changing in staffing and retirements, when, when Jake retired, he had, you know, he was a utility engineer by training um, and we kind of lost that expertise in house. So we needed to have uh, some of that uh, um, kind of expertise at a phone call. And this uh, is so far has been working uh, very well. From a planning point of view, we can uh, sort of anticipate and work with our engineers on a regular basis to know what's coming down the pipe and, and prioritize things. And Tyrone will talk more specifically about certain capital projects that, that we're working on, and, and there'll even be some examples of ones that uh, got challenges with consultants. Uh, so this uh, single consultant is, is that's one of the reasons we've kind of chose that model moving forward. Legislation and authority. So I, I spoke about this. You, you may remember some of this in the in the uh, introduction that we did with the board orientation. Uh, so we operate under provincial legislation for operating water systems. Drinking Water Protection Act and the Drinking Water Protection Regulation covers uh, all water systems in BC other than single family dwellings. 
The act sets out certain requirements for drinking water operators and suppliers to ensure the provision of safe drinking water to their customers. So this is something I often find that I'm uh, that people are surprised to hear. Anything except a single family water connection is by definition under the legislation, a water system that falls under those regulations. So obviously that includes the TNRD systems, but I know there's a lot of private systems in the electoral areas uh, that um, if it's you know a single pipe in the river and there's two homes connected, that becomes a water system that falls under the same provincial regulation and, and uh, legislation. So the requirements of this legislation ensure that our water systems are con uh, and construction proposals must be approved by public health engineers. So that would be through Interior Health. Water system operators must operate their systems in compliance with the requirements of the Act and operating permits. So we have permits for each system through Interior Health and that guides how we operate the systems. Uh, minimum water treatment and water quality standards are met and monitoring and testing are carried out as required. And that uh, water suppliers must have samples and analyzed in laboratories on a regular basis and approved by a provincial health officer. And systems serving more than 500 individuals must be cert have certified operators uh, operating them and public notifications must be made in the case of any water quality problems. Or three, two, one, zero. You're going to hear this a lot in the course of being on this committee. Um, so what this is is this is what's called they call it a drinking water objective. Uh, that is uh, when Tier Health has adopted a province-wide correct Yeah, it's a province-wide objective. So it's um, water suppliers are required to provide potable water to all users of the system using this objective. And it's a performance target for water suppliers to ensure that the provisions uh, of drinking water are safe. So this objective is applied as a performance standard for any new system that gets created uh, because the risk to human health is greatly reduced when they meet this objective. So what is this objective? So it's what it stands for is uh, for log inactivation of viruses. What for log is, is that's a measurement of the reduction of viruses in the water system. So the way to think about it is um, uh, four log is removing 99.999% of viruses, or another way of thinking of it is reducing the viruses by 10,000 times would be four log. Three log would be reducing by 1,000 times. So the third one is removal of uh, Cryptosporidium and Giardia by uh, three log. Two is the treatment processes for surface drinking water. So um, having two different processes, for example, filtration and UV would be two separate processes. Keep in mind that's for surface water drinking systems. Number one is having less than one NTU. So NTU is a measurement of turbidity. So the amount in turbidity is the suspended part particulate in water. So the goal is to have one than less in your, in your water, the actual target is 0 0.1 and zero total fecal coliforms and E. coli in the water. So that's, as I mentioned, that's the, the basically the benchmark for any new water systems. Um, however, as you're gonna hear through this presentation, uh, that's easier said than done in old um, and very small water systems. So meeting these objectives isn't easy, and actually most of our water systems are currently not meeting these objectives. Uh, the only systems that are fully meeting these objectives are our systems that are groundwater based. None of the surface water systems are meeting these objectives. So yeah, um, we have well soon to have four groundwater systems that would be meeting these objectives. All the other ones are not yet, but this is the goal that we're striving towards. Anything to add to that, Tyrone, before I move on? Okay. Any questions on that one? Okay. So what you have in front of you is the, and we printed this out as a purposefully a hard copy, nice color copy, 
is I want you all to keep this <laughs> on your shelf, on your desk. Um, this is our guiding document for how the systems operate, as well as the guiding document for any sort of changes and, and more, most importantly, any new acquisitions that the board would be considering. So uh, this is most recently updated and adopted by the board in October 2018. So I'm not going to go through it in detail. This went through this committee in, in very much detail prior to being adopted by the board. But I do want to kind of highlight a few points on it and just kind of give you a rough overview of what's in it. And then you could take it home and read it over and over again until you have it completely memorized and know all the things that are in it. Yeah, and there'll be a quiz next time. <laughs> So it's it's broken up into uh, six sections, and it's actually it's not as big of a document as it looks. There's a lot of nice big pictures, and it's point form a lot of it. Uh, but it's broken up into six sections. Uh, so the six parts are service delivery, water system management, cost recovery, governance, policy setting framework, and water system acquisition. So in each of those sections has a number of policies that relate to that. And as I mentioned, the reason we gave this to you is, is this is our guiding document as staff in operating these systems of how um, we both prioritize things from the operational side, but also giving us direction moving forward in terms of uh, uh, any capital projects or prioritizing capital projects uh, based on this strategy. And a big piece of it is uh, the acquisition, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So the first part around service delivery, I just want to highlight policy 1.1 that talks about levels of service. So when you when you get to that section, you'll see there's actually a pretty detailed table. Um, but the way that table is broken out is that there is what we call a base level of service. And then separate from that, there's an expanded level of service. And that expanded level of service would, it, it would be provided in consultation with water users um, on a system by system basis. A different way of saying that is that expanded level of services, if residents, users of that system want to pay additionally for those expanded services, then we could consider those expanded services. But the base level of service was what we strive to do on a on a on an ongoing basis to operate them. What I want to highlight because this question often comes up is uh, around fire protection. We have no base level of service for fire protection. So what that means is our regular service at all the utilities, all the water systems that we operate, we don't provide fire protection. Now, when I say that, what I mean is that that's not the base objective. In many cases, there is fire hydrants that are usable and functional that could be used by fire departments, but we often get questions and concerns around amount of flow or amount of water in the reservoir to provide adequate fire protection. Um, and I guess to be very blunt about it, that's not our base level service to worry about that. Our focus is providing usable drinking water to the residents and expanded level of service would be worrying about those things. And as you'll find out, we have a lot of operational issues just meeting our base level of service. And so this um, increasing, for example, capacity for fire protection is not the priority of these systems. Um, one of the reasons I bring this up is, in, you know, in some of our utility systems uh, that are in your areas, we may have also a TNRD run fire department, but in other areas we have, uh, we'll use Blue River for example, or Savanaugh for example, we have a TNRD run system, uh, water system, but the fire protection uh, is, and fire department is run by a different organization, the improvement district in, in, in those examples. Um, we also have utilities where we have fire hydrants, like uh, I'll use Deloro, for example. Um, but up until just recently with the expandage of Monte Creek, uh, uh, the Monte Creek Fire Hall, we don't actually, didn't actually have fire protection there. So um, there's the risk of this false sense of people thinking that there's fire protection because there's a fire hydrant there, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, and as we've talked about before, and which I want to talk about, you know, none of these systems that we built, we took them over, inherited them, TNRD made a decision to take these over. So um, why those fire hydrants were there when there was no fire protection is a whole different discussion uh, uh, in itself. But that being said, 
Um, you know, we do work with whether they're a TNRD run fire department or improvement district fire department, do work with them um, and and eager to communicate with them around use of fire hydrants, even testing of fire hydrants. But I will use this opportunity to put a plug out there, especially for those um, areas that have fire departments that are non TNRD fire departments to make sure um, uh, they understand that those are TNRD assets and uh, TNRD needs to be communicated with an, an approval if, if there's going to be use and when i say use testing of those fire hydrants obviously they're there to be used in, in a case of emergency so that's something tyrone does on a regular base uh, annual basis sort of send a reminder out to all the fire departments that if you're going to be doing any testing or connection to uh to contact us beforehand so we can uh, make sure we're aware of that uh more policies under level of service uh related to to that service delivery. The second part, uh, water system management operations and maintenance. These are a set of policies related to like how we as TNRD staff like operationally manage the system. So these are things like staffing considerations, use of contractors and consultants, and alternative approaches to any of those above mentioned things around staffing or, or contracting out. Second part, or sorry, the third part are policies related to decision making, communication, technical expertise. So, um, uh, for example, like the authority of making decisions, engaging engagement with water users and communication with, with the users of our system and how we obtain technical advice. Four sections around cost recovery. Um, so this is a, a big one, as you can imagine, and uh, there's a, a clear delineation in the policies between two categories, one being cost recovery from our systems that are currently owned or operated by the TNRD, uh, and second for that is cost recovery for systems that are candidates for acquisition uh, by the TNRD, um, and, and you'll realize why we have those as two separate things, because our cost recovery model with our current systems is is a, is a challenge in terms of being financially viable. Uh, so as you can imagine, the cost recovery policy around candidates for acquisition uh, is based around making sure they're fully financially viable over the long term uh, before we would support or recommend TNRD taking those on. Uh, the fifth one is uh, priority setting framework. So uh, this is in recognition that um, on a, to be honest, on a regular basis, that the TNRD will need to prioritize initiatives on maybe one TNRD water system over another, specifically when it comes to grant funding opportunities and which, which capital project on a utility system might uh, we submit a grant application in versus another. Typically, the grant application processes have limited, limited funding, uh, so we'll need to choose uh, what gets applied for. Uh, this policy or the pol this set of policies under part five discusses that looking at things based on what provides the greatest benefit to the greatest number of people, considering health impacts, environmental integrity, uh, financial needs, social impacts, and the potential of actually being successful in the grant application. Well, the sixth part is uh, the biggest chunk of this uh, document, and that has to do specifically with water system acquisitions. Um, so it's a very comprehensive set of policies outlining the process by which the TNRD would go about even considering acquiring an existing or a newly developed water system. So this would also apply if there's a new development happening and right off the get-go, the developer wants the TNRD to be, you know, to own and operate the system. Um, so again, handing this giving this out to you guys to, to look through in more detail but these policies include things around how we prioritize uh, the acquisition of these systems the process feasibility of it financial viability future considerations permits and licenses that are existing and payment and funding how they're even going to be funded and uh, and who pays for what So that was just, yeah, kind of a little teaser on what's in that document. Um, we will kind of regularly hear us referring to it uh, at this committee meeting, but uh, we'll also, unfortunately, we also have, I um, shouldn't say unfortunately, but we will also refer to this, you know, document and set of policies when, you know, speaking to community members who have concerns, uh, because sometimes they may 
disagree. I mean, I'll use fire protection as an example, may may disagree that 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 fire protection should be a base level service when this policy says it's not a base level service. And those kind of uh, conversations often happen or more so with um, Tyrone and Mick here when they're getting pub, uh, questions from, from residents. And this policy, this document is designed to be sort of a living document that could be revisited and updated on a regular basis. So we're happy to you know, have that discussion at this committee meeting if there's, and we'll be the first ones to bring new ones forward or amendments forward to this committee if we think things need to be changed or updated. Questions? Cool. Usaf? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, um, staff through the Chair. Uh, so do we, is there a, a section about like um, protocols for emergency communications, like for case in point, like um, in area A, um, there was that, um, the uh, the fuel truck crash and stuff like that. And and I was um, actually learning a bit from the residents asking me, you know, hey, is there supposed to be a a, a, a call to their residents and stuff? And I, and I, you know, learned that it's only boil water advisory that we're, is, is that part of the policy or is that something another separate? Um, yeah, I'll let Tyron answer. So under the Water System uh, Regulation Act, we're required each utility to have an emergency response and contingency plan. And so those kind of responses are under that versus this group of policies. Thank you. Director Hutton. Yeah, direct staff to the chair. Um, with these fire halls, like the two that are in my area, the Pritchard one and the up and coming Monty Creek one, where would they access their water on site uh, at their stations or? Yeah, uh, through the chair, uh, good question. So it depends on where where the, uh, so in that, using Pritchard, for example, we do have uh, uh, fire hydrants in the, the Pritchard area on the north side of the river. Uh, but anything outside of that area, that's it's really more of an operational question on the on the fire department side. So, but that's that's a challenge with rural fire departments. So our model in general is that we have fire tenders with all our rural fire departments, and so that fire tender would accompany the engine to the scene. And then part of what we do, and part of what Jason's role, and and working with the fire chiefs on an ongoing basis, is to identify where to get water. Uh, so in many of our, our fire protection areas, we actually have um, in-ground storage tanks for water that are strategically located so we can refill the tender when fire fighting the fire. As Rick Nickel um, mentioned to me that we approached him for access to water on that dugout in his field uh, on the Highway 97. So I'm just curious where they got all their water. Thank you. Yeah, so that sounds like a that was part of that process that would have been the fire chief or our fire protection manager, Jason, who would reach out to secure that water. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just going back to your comments about uh, the 43210 uh, scale that you mentioned that the majority of our systems don't meet those objectives. I'm just wondering, are we in the utility business because we have to be, uh, because we're we're being asked to be by the uh, residents, or have we just inherited a, a bunch of uh, stuff here that we really don't do a good job with? Or yeah, so good, kind of a loaded question. Um, I'll break that down. Are we in the utility business because we have to be? Uh, one answer to that question is no, we don't have to be in the utility business. Um, we entered the utility business because over the course of a number of years that we were the board, TNRD board was approached and approved acquiring these community water systems, the privately owned systems. Once they became our systems, then the answer is then we had to be. Because there are systems now where we are the water purveyor and under the regulation, we're required to provide you know, meet those standards to provide that drinking water. Um, so the challenges, and, and and maybe Tyrone can jump in and add to this, but the challenges we have around providing that um, level of service, the 4321, uh, has to do with 
the actual infrastructure and, and capital, not our operational restrictions in terms of expertise and abilities. That'd be a, a fair way to summarize that. And so as, as, as Tyrone walks through each system, he'll be identifying, um, we have uh, ma uh, master plans for each system. And really that master plan is um, how we can meet those objectives. What, what needs to be done for us to actually meet those objectives? And for each of our systems, that's different. And Tyrone's going to walk through that with you guys, the majority of this meeting today on those one, one by one. So just a supplemental then, you're talking about um, future acquisitions uh, that, that, would, that could be possible to us. Um, what, would, what would our strategy be there? Why, why would we be, why would we, we be out looking for, for more systems? Or are we looking for more systems? Really good question. No, we're not out there looking for more systems. Um, however, we have acquired these systems over the years. So the policy is to make sure that we have a very robust process that if approached, the board has a already guiding policy of how that would work. Because the if we didn't have the policy, the concern was it would be a, maybe a for lack of a better word, quick decision of the board to acquire it and then find out later that there's challenges we weren't aware of. So as you look at that policy, it's very detailed about doing a feasibility study, having a whole transition plan, ensuring that they're fully financial, financially viable before we would even support moving forward. Thank you. Director Morris. Thank you through the chair to Tyrone and Jamie. Uh, some of these questions, I've got four sort of lists here coming out of what you've uh, uh, chatted about, and you may end up becoming to them already. So not even in order of priority. Um, you mentioned the, uh, the, the, I've used Black Pines as an example, but I think what you were talking about was where there are hydrants and they're standing there, <laughs> sitting there. Um, and we're, then there's a situation. Um, are those, those, are they actually part of our fire protection service? Do we have a number of those throughout, uh, uh, throughout the TNRD where there are the hydrants, but they aren't actually part of our system? That's question one, probably an easy one. Yeah, I, I would, better way to look at it um, and is that the hydrants are part of a water system. The hydrants are not part of the fire protection system. So if there's fire protection, the hydrants are available for use, absolutely. Okay. But that's the way to think about it is that the hydrants are there as part of that whole utility system. So an example of Deloro, there was a there's hydrants there when there wasn't even fire protection. Okay. And 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 then to um Director Houghton's point, we have a lot of areas where we have fire protection, but we don't have hydrants and we use other mechanisms of getting water. Okay. So Anything in general, that sort of that sort of a hydrant situation, basically they don't have fire protection. What they have is some water they can tap into if they need to. Well, yeah, I guess it would, it would depend on the specific area. Some areas have both, they have fire protection and they have hydrants. But... Okay, so secondary question to that then. Acquisition, you've mentioned the word acquisition um, and are, are is is the sense that we need to acquire more? Is that the general longer term direction that you're thinking when you use that terminology? Yeah. Uh, generally, I would say no. Okay. However, you know when you when you read through those policies, um, again, it's really heavy on making sure they're financially viable. So when I say generally no, we're not looking at acquiring any. There could be a situation where there may be, let's just use an example of a, I'll make up a fictional example, or could, I think it does actually exist out there. We may have a TNRD system, TNRD owned system that's bordering a different private system. Yeah. It may be beneficial to both areas to join that system into one. And then you're having you know, economies of scale of more people paying into it. Maybe one system has a better water treatment process than the other, or maybe there's two different water sources, then you have a backup system if they become one. So that's an example of where it could be something that would be viable and we'd go through the whole process of the acquisition policy.
but it may ultimately come out that it would be a good thing and a benefit to the region as, as a whole. That, that that helps me address the, the acquisition existing question that I had. And then finally, uh, uh, this is more probably of a lack of knowledge question from me. Um, the community systems that you've alluded to, the ones that are not under our they, the testing um, and all of that is strictly up to them. We even if if there's something happening adjacent to one of our own systems, right? They they are literally church and state. They're separate completely. Is that right? Yeah. And we don't have any liability. Is where I'm going. Correct. Right? I would. Uh, yeah. I, well, the way I would address that is sort of clarify that. We're not the regulator. We have we have no regulator role to that. IH, IH does. Yeah. So okay. we we are regulated by IH, and the private system be regulated by IH. Right. So somewhere where we had one that's ours, and right beside it, there's a community one. No risk liability to us. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Director Uso. Thank you, Chair. Um, sorry, and then uh, just had some thoughts um, related to Director Morris and uh, Director Smith's uh, about acquisitions. Going the opposite direction, is there any uh, presidents in regional districts like uh, selling the systems back to somebody else, <laughs> private operators, or like uh, to local societies who might want to run it? I don't know the answer to that. Oh, gosh. Anyone else know if that's happened? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I will say that part of the acquisition policy is that it sets the maximum amount that we would pay for a system is $1. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, and that's typically how these came to be um, okay. uh, operated by the TNRD. It was more that they weren't financially viable and there wasn't the expertise and even volunteer base in some of these cases of operating these systems. So um, oh, okay. the ask came to the TNRD to take them on. So tough for us to get off the hook yeah. now. If, if the unfortunate reality is the ones that are financially viable and profitable, the private systems out there are not the ones that we own or operate. Those are the ones that are already existing. I mean, you could use an example of Tobiano. Tobiano was owned and operated by the developer. They actually sold the system to a separate private company. So Corex now owns that system that was previously owned by the developer. But it's a profitable system. Uh, They're not going to come and ask us to take it over and then make money. Not vape, not vape and no. <laughs> um, sorry. And, and then second part, um, just sharing some experience we had uh, this past winter in area A with the frozen pipes and the, one of the uh, mobile home parks. Um, like uh, like you mentioned, those we don't have any sort of obligation legally for um, systems that are community like that are not ours. But I know we had a um, just a gesture of goodwill to the residents to open up the sportsplex for use shower usage. So um, I'm not sure if we need, need to look into a policy for that um, in, you know, weather disasters emergencies you know and the event of a community-wide uh water system outage private water system outage you know yeah the communications like for if something happens with a private water system yeah it was, so the scenario was yeah a private water system was down and um yeah, we offered some technical advice, but also then the community of Clearwater worked with Clearwater to provide options for those residents to use other facilities like the, the sports mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, perhaps we could look at some sort of communications, but I think if we de were to develop a policy, we'd be sort of running the risk of creating some liability for ourselves. Yeah, our, our, and, and expectations and maybe creating some confusion that we sort of have some ownership or role in the in the system when we don't, but yeah, there the, might be a balance in terms of like a communications that we put out. Yeah, and the challenge would be that, that I want to say it would have to be on a case-by-case -case basis how we address it. I mean, I'll use an example that, that was, um, you know, an unfortunate scenario during the atmospheric river, there was a water system uh, that was majorly damaged uh, just outside of Lytton. Um, 
And so the residents there were completely out of water for a long time and there wasn't, didn't appear to be that much of a sense of urgency for the, the repair to happen. So it was very delayed. And so, you know, the residents were pushing us from the emergency operations center side, but we had no ability to force the owner of the system to do the repairs. We could lift the evacuation order on the, on the properties, but that didn't magically make their water system work. Um, so that that was a you know it's one of those scenarios where you know the the one in area A was short term during the freeze up, but this one was weeks if not months of the the system being out of commission. And in that case, the you know, did we uh, uh, provide No, so that that's the responsibility of the system owner. So uh, what we did as a TNRD in that situation was try to sort of lobby politically and 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 uh, towards the province sort of uh, pursuing enforcement on the on the, the water system owner uh, just I have a comment and it might help frame this discussion uh, we in in the municipality as a developer you would end up paying <clears throat> development cost charges Typically, if you're building a subdivision, you'd pay those development cost charges to the municipality, and then you'd hook into their system, their system that they're already running up and running and what have you. And so the developer really doesn't think that much other than the development cost charge because somebody else is running it. In our area, in our regional area, 27 years ago when I was in here, uh, they said, Mike, we don't do sewer, we don't do water, we don't do fiber optic, we don't do any of those sorts of things. You'll have to do that because we're a regional district, we're a rural district. So the developer has to decide, is he in the water treatment business? Is he in the sewer treatment business? And the capital that he puts towards those things is very dependent on whether he's going to continue to run it and perhaps sell it or give it to Jamie for a buck. So if I'm going to give something away for a buck, how much money am I going to put into that water and sewer system? And so what we've seen in this province, not just in our area, is that the, the guy that's doing a subdivision does perhaps the minimal standards and spends enough to get the job done. But once he's sold his lots and once he's moved on, hey, what do I do with this thing that I no longer really have an interest in? I'll give it to Jamie for a buck. <laughs> and of course, how, how good is that system? So this document is, I think, a response to a general condition, which is if you're going to give us stuff uh, to take over, we need to say what the conditions are, what the quality of the system is, what might be required. You might have to give us some dough along with taken over those dilapidated pumps, for instance. And, and so I think that, that that perhaps has been the experience. Why do we have 16 systems? Because the residents come up and say, gee, you know, the developer's long gone. What do we do? Uh, how do we deal with this? And so I think that that's, a, that's been an evolution. So I think we're getting ahead of the game by having the conditions under which we would approve things. And I think that this committee has to really integrate with the planning department to say right from the get-go, okay, if you're coming in to build a 10-lot subdivision or a 1,000-lot subdivision, what's your long-term long goal? What's your plan? And try to fit those things together so that we might be better prepared for that. Is that a fair comment about that? Yeah, yeah, I would definitely say that's a fair comment. And the example that that you gave of how we came about to having these is, is bang on. Uh, go ahead, Lee. Yes. So my question would be to you and also to Jamie, but if we have this document, what about aging systems that do not meet the standards of this, but are in as Ebola as an example, as their population ages, I can see eventually the TNRD being dumped with this water system that we don't know anything about. But if it doesn't meet these standards, what happens to the residents at that time? 
Yeah, so we, um, I guess something to clarify is we don't, we're not, I guess back to Director Smith's comment is we don't have to be in the water business. So for example, if if Avola said, well, we can't operate the system anymore, we aren't required to take it on. We can take it on in this pros, these sets of policies lay out how that would would work and what would be required to take that on. But we don't have to. So, well, I mean, and that's and that's when they would and and from my point of view, we'd say, well, this is our our policy, and from a staff point of view, this is what we're following before we would support taking on the system. And that's the same thing we'd say to this board, is it's saying either it's meeting or can meet these these requirements, or it does not. And 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 sorry. Darren, you can jump in on that one. So if the like an Ebola failed, then it would default to the province, and then the province would approach us or a private um, purveyor to take it on. So. And we would also tell the province, these are our rules, regardless of who asks us. Yeah. I know we're going to get into some of the individual things, so I'll just be quick about this, just for perhaps it's helpful. There's water systems and then there's uh, there's distribution systems and then there's water treatment systems and not and not all water distribution systems are water treatment systems. So you can have you can inherit or operate a water distribution system, but because of the changing conditions, the turbidity in the water that you're supplying from, you might very well find yourself in a boil water advisory condition or chronic boil water every summer because you don't have a treatment system and a treatment system can be as much or more than the distribution the cost of the distribution system so it's more it's not it's not an on off switch you have a distribution system great everything is fine it's a more a dimmer switch you have a distribution system that is operating at a certain standard but can only handle that standard and if we inherit things we have systems, for instance, in Savino, which uh, area uh, J, uh, where it's a distribution system, but every summer there's a boil water advisory, and we're going to have to look at water treatment, uh, flocculation systems, ultraviolet systems, in addition to chlorinators and that sort of thing. So it's it's there's a there's quite a capital cost associated with building a really solid municipal system as opposed to a distribution system and i suspect we're going to hear about that a little bit <laughs> yeah so that, that is a good segue if um as i tyrone has a, a a lot of information to share um this section was just the introduction that i gave so tyrone will get into the meat and potatoes of it here uh if chair wants us to, to move on Everyone good with the lights dim like this, or do you want them back on? Good. Great. Good afternoon. Um, Tyrone McCabe, Manager of Utility Services. Thanks for the intro, Jamie. Um, this presentation will not be as quick as Jamie's was. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go into some detail on each of the utilities, and I've structured it so we have a, a brief department overview. Um, talk about each of the water and sewer systems that we have. We spend a lot of time talking about water, but we also operate two wastewater utilities. Then I'll talk about our water metering program and our water meters that we have in the TNRD. Then we'll have some questions at the end or as we as we go. So what do we do? We, um, our operators are responsible for the water quality monitoring and sampling. So that's pretty straightforward and we're really good at that. Um, <laughs> We have on our right, we have a our online chlorine analyzer plus an online turbidity analyzer. That's all tied into a regional SCADA system. Our operators and our staff have that information available at their fingertips, on their phones, on their tablets, on their computers at work. Um, we also collect water samples. So under the Drinking Water Protection Act and the regulations, we're required to 
collect a minimum of four samples per month from each water system. It may be increased, um, such as in the case of Savanov, based on population. So those are collected and taken to a provincial accredited lab um, for analysis. And those results are all posted by the um, Interior Health Authority on the website, which we have linked to on our TNRD website as well. So those bacteriological samples are all, um, and results are all available to the public um, as they are processed by the labs. We are um, hands off on that. We collect the samples, drop them off to the lab. They're couriered, um, analyzed, and then results posted. So that's a question we do get um, a fair bit by email and telephone call in the utility department is where can I find the samples or the results? So um, just so you are all aware, it, they are available on our website. Plus uh, Drinking Water for Everyone is a provincial website, um, or sorry, Interior Health website that shows all the private and public water systems out there, as well as the current condition, whether they're on a all clear water quality advisory or boil water notice or do not drink, do not consume orders. So. What else do we do? Uh, fun stuff, equipment maintenance and repair. So we have some check valves that tend to corrode and fail. We have a larger check valve there, nice and shiny. Um, the picture on the left was the interior of that same check valve. We have our water pumps. So we have to get water <laughs> into the system. And like Director Grenier mentioned, we are mostly distribution systems. So pumping is very important. Um, and our staff do pull these pumps apart, take the skids apart, uh, remove these pumps for repair and replace uh, motors. In the picture, last picture there is a picture of a vertical turbine pump in Savannah, which we craned in and out. Um, part of that project was actually to cut a couple hatches in the roof of the building so that we can easily access and remove these pumps. That pump's only about 12 to 13 feet long, but the previous mechanism to remove it was to actually um, physically unspool it. So twist it apart, take the motor off the top, and then unspool the shaft and pull it all apart in pieces inside a building. So we've upgraded that um, through gas tax funding. Yeah, and sometimes we, often we do this, not when it's nice and sunny out um, or warm, so. Then we have infrastructure maintenance and repair. This is basically underground work that we do. Here we can see a pretty classic example of what we have. We have an awful lot of asbestos uh, cement pipes in the ground. And we, when we do repairs on that, you can no longer purchase AC pipe or fittings. So we use couplers and put in C900 um, PVC pipe. And there's a new saddle on that pipe with a service line going to a customer. This is what people don't see um, that we are responsible for. There's another example. This one was previously a direct tap. So the old way, the uh, yeah, the previous way of doing these was to take this tap right here off this water main, and they would actually just drill a hole and thread that into the pipe with no saddle holding it on. Um, so when we have these failures, we will put a double strap saddle, which is a standard that we use, um, which is also in our subdivision um, bylaw. And then we will, we always have a, a small rise in the pipe um, to allow for contraction expansion and then tie into the, this, the water service. And then we have our, our lovely fire hydrants and traffic tends to drive over them. Um, a lot of fun. <laughs> so this hydrant here, I believe this one came out of Savannah. We've had one recently in Blue River, um, hit by vehicles just, and some of them have been like quite a ways off the travel lanes and just someone drives over them, parks on top. Um, they're not parking spots. So this, uh, you can see on here, the, 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 oops, wrong button. <clears throat> It actually broke the entire um, hydrant lead, cracked it, just catastrophic failure there. And then we had to shut off the isolation valve in order to um, stop the release of, of our 
water into the into the environment. So fortunately for us, when these are um, damaged by vehicles, then it is an ICBC claim and, and the majority of the work is covered and the damage is covered and the loss are covered by um, insurance. So that's what our, our staff of four do. Um, we have a mini excavator, we have a small dump truck, we have a portable generator, we have equipment, a trailer with all the fittings and stuff on board to go out there to any one of our systems and make a repair um, when we have to. In fact, this morning we we received a, a call from a customer in a water system that there was a fair bit of water pooling on the road and our operator went out there and, and checked it and the leak was actually downstream of the of the water meter so it was a private side issue so homeowner issue so we turned the water off but i have been at a utility meeting where i have been i did depart early for um <laughs> a water main break um these things don't happen when we want them to happen not that we ever want them to happen but they do happen at inopportune moments and our um our staff are very very good at, at responding and fixing these um also keep in mind that we do have 11 water utilities spread between Blue River to Loon Lake down to Spence's Bridge and back over here towards Pritchard. So it's a fairly significant area to cover. Um, and we have a group of four and not all of them are experts at everything. Um, we have a couple guys that can operate machines and a couple guys that are, are good in the ditch and a couple guys that are good with electrical, um, but not all four. Um, so we have to have the, with that small group, we have to have um, the right guys available for that. So there might be some jobs where there's only one of our four people that are are available or um, uh, trained to to perform that task. So it is a, a definitely a challenging um, challenging to manage at, at times. Nick, <laughs> yeah, it has its moments. So it will, we, I guess, I'll, I'll summarize it by we're doing our best with what we have. So I'll start with. Um, each of the water systems and I'll go by area. So area A, we have Baven B community water system. We have approximately 139 connections there. This was constructed in 1972, a population of approximately 252 people and the TNRD acquired this system in 2004. That acquisition predates and all these acquisitions predate this um, policy, the water system acquisition and management strategy. And um, like it was alluded to previously, the the strategy was developed in part due to the um, the types of systems that we were inheriting or taking on to give us a, a framework for acquiring these. So the top left picture is the pump house in Bay That's where the um, the water passes through a flow meter inside that building, is chlorinated, and then pumped up to the reservoir, which is the Right hand, right picture on the right hand side. The top of the reservoir has also received an upgrade funded primarily through gas tax. Um, previous to the solar panel and the batteries located on the on the top of the reservoir, there was no railing on the reservoir. There was no access. There was a access ladder, but no safe way to actually um, um, do perform any work on the on the reservoir roof. So we've installed a, a safety railing on it. We've located the batteries and the solar panel up to the top. It was the level transmitter, which operates the pumps in Babenby, was run on batter, is run on battery power still. Um, but previous to the solar panel, the batteries were located at the bottom, the base of the reservoir, and it had to be changed out. So make it even more exciting, we had no access road to the reservoir. So if you've ever been to Vavenby and you can see the, um, <laughs> when you're when you're traveling up Highway 5, I believe it's the west side of Highway 5, there's a fairly steep bank um, just before you get to the um, the signage in, in Vavenby. Our operator, our contract operator up there used to walk up that bank off the side of the highway with a new battery that was charged to change them out. So that was the, the kind of conditions that we were we were dealing with. And these are some of the improvements that we're making. And these improvements are only possible through um, grant funding, gas tax funding. We don't um, generate enough revenue in the Bay community water system 
to purchase solar panels, pay for engineering for um, for railings, and um, and you know, yeah, put new intakes in, and let alone a, a water treatment plant. So, bottom left photo is the intake um, and the North Thompson River. So we have an infiltration gallery as well as a direct pipe into the middle of the South Thompson River or North Thompson River. And that the pumps reside in that um, large culvert, and then they're pumped through that, that building on um, the top left. And this is what the distribution system looks like in Bavenby. So we have approximately 5.1 kilometers of water mains. 3.4 kilometers of, of those water mains are AC pipe. The remainder are PVC with, I believe there is some ductile um, iron pipe that um, by the highway and gas line or Trans Mountain crossing. The sizes range from 50 millimeters to 150 millimeters. So nothing larger than six inches. Um, and the majority of the AC was installed in 1973. On the south side, of the of the river, we have um, PVC pipe, and that was all installed between 2006 and 2008. That was an expansion of the of the system after it was acquired by the TNRD. Um, so our intake is down in here in this area. Our reservoir is up in this area. We have very minimal looping. We basically have a, a branched network, um, so it makes water quality um a challenging um event looping helps with flows as well as with fire flows um so in order to go into the the fire um protection piece here all the red um symbols are represent fire hydrants and or stand pipes so and not every fire hydrant in here has a six inch pumper port they may just be a two and a half inch port um on them and stand pipes are only two and a half inch. Uh, one story I'll share with Vaven B, we we had a, a stand pipe at the end of, of Huntsbet, um, which is right here. And we were doing our, our hydrant system or water system uh, flushing and pressure testing. And we would get adequate pressure on the stand pipe, but then when we would flow it, it would gush out and it trickle down to nothing. So we had enough water line breaks in, in Vavenby that we dug up pretty much that entire road, replaced every water service in there. And while we were doing that, we removed the saddle from the main and found that there was a two inch saddle over top of a three quarter inch hole. So welcome to the TNRD utilities. <laughs> um, yeah, so those are the those are the hidden things that we inherit. Um, we can see with that pump houses are need repair that so we don't have filtration um, that pumps, you know, can be replaced, but those are the mysteries that we're, that we're finding as well um, coming across. So, um, yeah, it's just a question on this system. Uh, your water intake uh, pumps the water up directly to the reservoir and then it's gravity feed down or not. No, so the the there is no dedicated water main to the reservoir or the system. It is pumped directly into the distribution system, and the excess makes its way to the reservoir. So the reservoirs open up the network um, and maintain a, a consistent pressure and help minimize the pressure fluctuations when the pumps are on or off. And then if you could comment on each of the systems, what the treatment level is so that we understand that. Yep. And I believe that's on the next one, but uh, this is one of the first slides I put together a while back. So uh, this one is surface water with chlorination and nothing else. <laughs> so don't wait for it. Um, we did in, in 2017, 2018, we completed master planning for all of our communities. And in those master plans, it laid out um, the improvements and recommendations for each system. So some of those recommendations for Dave and B, and pretty common to all of our systems were to reduce leakage and encourage water conservation. So that's done. And I have a slide in the water meter section on the Dave and B system and, and our successes there. Um, one of the other options was to explore for groundwater conversions. So 
versus using North Thompson as the water source and surface water was to look for groundwater in Bayview. That's expensive, but we did explore that option when we did a preliminary design for a water treatment plant there. The other option is to install treatment for North Thompson water source. This is all aimed at, at meeting the 43210 guidelines. And another one was to replace the reservoir trunk main, um, which is the crossing of the highway. And also another portion of the of the water system that where it crosses the um, CN rail line, which is it's quite an old crossing. There is a casing in there, but also to remain to replace that because it is a critical main. So we have completed a, a preliminary design for a water treatment plant for Vavenby um, just recently. And that is what we require to be what we would call a shelf ready um, grant application. So now our, our price tag came in around $5 million for a water treatment plant for 130 um, connections. So those are the kind of dollars that we're that we're looking at to meet the 43210s on these systems that we have. And now we're, we, we have that one shelf ready. Um, and the next things are just to, to keep the system working as is, um, monitor the water quality issue, water quality advisories and boil water notices as the conditions change. Another recommendation was to loop the system and this would um, improve fire uh, flows as well as the hydraulic capacity is and provide redundancy to some of the water mains and the critical mains. So. Uh, McCorvey to Kavasinski, Harmon Road to McCorvey, Hunspet to Gurunatic. So this is came out of the the master planning, and uh, we actually assessed the the avail fire flow availability. So we're you know minimum twenty four liters per second up to fifty seven. The typical number that they're using for these is about sixty seven liters per second um, for the rural areas. Since this, though, we've also acquired a piece of property um, right here adjacent to um, Kapsinski Road for a future water treatment plant. So that's where we would build a water treatment plant, um, run the piping up from here and across. We've also secured a right of way um, through this property that would allow us to loop McCorvey and Kapsinski Road. So that would provide the hydraulic um, capacity we would need for a water plant to pump water up to the reservoir. And that's, um, that's where we're at with Bavenby and the recommendations so far and the progress we've made. So typically we, the majority of the recommendations follow a similar thing, um, meter your, your water, reduce your leakage, that reduces your maximum day demands, which allows you to size a water treatment facility um, at a, a smaller size, so you're not trying to treat for all this water that's being wasted. And then find out how much that's going to cost and wait for a grant program to come around that um, fits the, that your project fits the requirements for. All right, so that's area A. <laughs> area B, Blue River. So approximately 205 connections in Blue River. This system was constructed 1920 and 1960. There have been upgrades uh, since. Population is really hard to, to pin down in, in Blue River. And this is all information from our master planning as well. But there's a, um, with with the heli skiing operation there um, and the snowmobiling, the recreational activities, there's a, a significant fluctuation. But the, so we call it 200 plus for the population. Uh, we acquired this system in 1992. So this is a groundwater source. Um, this is the pump house on the, the picture on the left. And one of the previous projects there, when they initially, um, I should say, when we initially looked for groundwater, is a groundwater source. And this is the one of the challenges with groundwater. It's, it's like throwing a dart um, to figure out if you're going to hit water or not and what the quality of that water will be. So the initial well that was drilled was high in iron and manganese, they exceeded the aesthetic objective set out by the guidelines for Canadian drinking water quality. And so this filtration system that's pictured on the right uh, was installed 
as well. So two other two production wells were then drilled, and the water quality <laughs> was amazing. Um, these filter these, these filter units were never put into service, so they have been removed, and they currently sit at six six zero Mission Flats Road, Kamloops, BC. Uh, and we, I, I'm glad you mentioned what about Dave and B. Well, we actually, I had True um, Consulting put a, a, a report together looking at the options for reusing these filters elsewhere. So we have that. Um, unfortunately, they're not a great fit at any of our communities. Um, but yeah, those, those are our different projects. <laughs> For, for future stuff. So that is something that we are looking at, at um, or examining some options for those filters. Um, <clears throat> so in Blue River, we have 11 kilometers of water main, 3.8 kilometers of AC, 7.1 kilometers of PVC, and from 50 to 250 millimeter in size. The AC pipe was installed in 66 and the PVC was installed from 1987 onwards. So this is a fairly new ortho photo. We had these done in September, and you can see the Trans Mountain Pipeline Camp up on the north side of this here. We also, our current groundwater source, our wells are right here. So our pump house is here, our reservoir is just outside the, the view, and then the majority of the Blue River distribution and community resides down here with the um, Eleanor Lake, as well as the the heli skiing um, set up there. So we have, I think, three crossings of the of the highway here. Those are all critical, but they have also allowed for uh, water main looping. So if one fails, we can shut it off and still provide um, water to the rest of the the community. Um, some of the recommendations we've had from this was reduce leakage. I also have another slide on that. That one is quite um, impressive, I think. Anyways, so we've, we've done a, a great job of that. Uh, completed GARP assessment. So this is a groundwater at risk of pathogens assessment. That's a requirement for any groundwater source. Complete that and find out what are the, what are the risks of pathogens in your groundwater. So surface water, it's assumed. Groundwater, you're trying to figure out whether it's under the influence of surface water or not. Um, that was completed. And then it's, as part of the GARP assessment, um, this has been a fun topic, but was to install one of the recommendations coming out of the GARP assessment was to install um, chlorination disinfection in the system. So Interior Health Authority um, took that, issued conditions on our permit, that required us to install chlorination, come up with a financial plan for the system, uh, confirm the surface seals on the wells, and cap and abandon the previous test wells appropriately. And we had a deadline of July 1st, 2022 to complete that. So that's how the regulations and the Interior Health Authority work. So you have a permit to operate, and then they have conditions on permit that may um, that are specific to each system. So. The 43210 was something that came out between 2003 and 2006 on all water systems. IHA just blanketed every single water system with those conditions to meet that. Um, enforcement's a different story, but on, in the case of Blue River, the disinfection was to be installed as well as those other conditions by July 1st, 2022. So we did. Uh, standby generator is another recommendation. And that's currently in progress for Blue River. In the meantime, we have a, a manual, no, an automatic transfer switch on site that is configured for our portable generator that resides at our shop and can be deployed when required. So another recommendation was looping. Uh, Johnson to Stewart Street, this is for redundancy. Um, Blue River West frontage to Stewart. That will also provide some redundancy there. Sorry, the Johnson and Stewart is actually for um, water quality. So right now we have Johnson and Stewart Street are down the south end of uh, Blue River, and we have one water main. Two, this one is actually in trespass. We do not have a right of way um, for this water main, 
and the, there's a Trans Mountain laydown yard right here now as well. So this water main, if this ever failed, and if the owner of this property required us to remove this water main, we would have no water down to the south end of Blue River. So one of the um, recommendations is to provide a loop down here and come across. And we've actually, when we were looking at a at a recent grant, we've examined bringing that loop down the west frontage road all the way down and crossing us at Stewart Street. And that would provide us a redundancy for that main street, main that services um, Stewart and Johnson. Again, they, um, a lot of these improvements were focusing on the hydraulic flows and fire flows to achieve fire flows for the community. So um, that also plays into the, the pri prioritizing the improvement list here. That's it for area B. <laughs> wonder if we should take a five minute break. Okay. okay.
Okay. That's what everyone wants to hear. Okay, folks, uh, we're making some, we got a lot to go through, so we we uh, we better power at it. And uh, I think we're going to be going to at least 4.30 on this. So um, thank you. All right. Um, so we're moving on to area E. This is the Loon Lake community water system. So 51 connections, 105 population, very seasonal. Um, last I heard, we had two full-time residents up there. When I started at the TNRD almost five years ago now, we had four full-time residents. The rest are, are seasonal in Loon Lake. This system was constructed in 1974 and acquired in 2006. Again, this is disinfection with sodium hypochlorite, so chlorinated water. It's a shallow um, well influenced by surface water, um, the Loon Lake adjacent to it. Olivia, this isn't working. Thank you. All right, so we have 1.9 kilometers of water main here, all PVC, four inch and six inch or 100 and 150 millimeters installed in 1974. We have some of our recent improvements here. We have installed um, an automatic flushing unit on the end of the system. So unfortunately, this is a dark gray line because that's a, a four inch main versus six. And so it's all a bunch of dead ends in Loon Lake. So we have iron and manganese issues there, which precipitate out because there's low use, which causes discolored water and quite a few complaints. So flushing is the most effective method of that, of dealing with that right now. So these automatic flushing units allow us to um, program them and they'll flush a certain quantity of water at the set frequency. <clears throat> so some of the recommendations we had for, from the master planning were for some upgrades to, to deal with the water here. So we had a water treatment plant using the existing source. This was estimated in 2018 at being $2.1 million. I guarantee that's going to be a significantly higher than that now. Um, based on a, another project we'll talk about. <clears throat> Option two was drilling a well in Loon Lake. Um, and this was a water treatment for that well source of $2.4 million. Um, <clears throat> and then distribution, a new reservoir, some looping, dedicated line to the reservoir, uh, water metering, source tap assessment, et cetera. So the water metering has been done. Um, <laughs> happy to say. <laughs> <laughs> so our current approach for this um, to deal with the water, the current water quality issues that we have there is to install automatic flushing units on dead end lines. Like I mentioned, we have one installed at this point. We have another one sitting in the yard waiting to be installed this summer. And then we are going to explore the feasibility of a water fill station at the pump house for drinking water. So similar to what you might see on the shoe swap, where there are places you can take your five gallon jug, fill it up with drinking water. And then you can use your lake water for bathing and, and dishes. Um, we're looking at feasibility of that. Uh, initial chat with Interior Health about this was that that would create a separate water system. So it would be an all clear on that one and a boil water notice on the remaining Loon Lake water system. So that might be an option um, that we would present at a future date once the feasibility for it is done. Um, it's just, it's, Loon Lake is challenging because it's it's a seasonal residence and when we look at our policies and the the most benefit for the most people, it's really hard to, to quantify that for, for the Loon Lake system. So <clears throat> moving on to area I, Spence's Bridge Community Water System. So here, this is a, a unique system for us in that it's we have 110 connections plus the Cooks Ferry Indian Band. Population of approximately 280 people built in 1950 and 1960, acquired by the TNRD in 2006. These are groundwater wells with sodium hypochlorite disinfection. And we have a shared use agreement with Cooks Ferry um, First Nation. So what that shared use agreement means is that the wells and the ground, the source water is actually on the um, on IR1. And there's two, there's three pumps, and there's two directions the water can go. It can go to the IR1 reservoir, the Kumshin Reservoir, or it can go to the Spences Bridge Community Water System Reservoir. Now there's multiple other um, IRs 
that are fed off of that Spencer's Bridge Community Water System Reservoir. Um, and the infrastructure is owned either by Cooks Ferry or by the TNRD. There's no shared um, ownership or joint ownership of the, of the infrastructure itself. So it's a shared use agreement, basically meaning that uh, the TNRD can use Cooks Ferry infrastructure. Cooks Ferry can use TNRD infrastructure to provide water to the respectful customers. <clears throat> this is the overview of the system. So 12 and a half kilometers of water main, 50 millimeter through 250 millimeter. Majority was installed in 1963. And the remainder of the upgrades were done between 87 and 2010. So there used to be a, you know, a bridge, another, a different bridge in Spence's Bridge. <laughs> it's a lot of bridges. And a water main used to run across there. Now there's a new water main that runs across the, the new bridge in Spence's Bridge. And <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, didn't realize I was going to crack myself up putting the ceiling. Yeah. Um, and there have been, there've been multiple upgrades down here. Um, for, for example, Deer Lane, we had a, a new water main put in in Deer Lane here that improves the, the capacity, the hydraulic capacity of the network. And you can see the, the outline in the orangey yellow of the Spences Bridge community water system. So this is a TNRD service area. This is a um, IR in here. And then there's uh, the IRs in this area as well. And the IRs down here, which are all serviced through our infrastructure, or we service our customers through their infrastructure. So um, it's, uh, it's a pretty uh, neat little arrangement. And we have a management committee as part of that um, shared use agreement that both Jamie and myself sit on, as well as two representatives from the Cooksbury Indian Band. Um, and we make the management decisions for the community water system um, in conjunction. And there's a whole, there's a, a fairly lengthy agreement and um, it can be reviewed at a later date. So some of the recommendations from the master planning on this, which did not specifically look at the Kamashin IR1, but reduce leakage and maximum day demand on the system. And that's all targeted at, at water metering. One of our issues in Spence's Bridge is that we don't have an awful lot of groundwater capacity. Um, <clears throat> we do have adequate storage and we do have a decent um, quantity of water, but the maximum day demand in Spence's Bridge was to, um, quite high. And the goal is to to focus on water conservation and reduction of that maximum data demand. A standby generator for a well site in Spence's Bridge, this would allow us to, so the well site is over on IR1 and it's serviced by uh, a separate, a different power grid than the uh, north side of, of the Thompson River. And typically it's a, it's a pretty stable power system where our wells, our supply is, until the atmospheric river occurred, um, which took out most of that. And then um, we also have line of sight issues with our, our reservoir and our pumps. And so we have a, a radio repeater at the Cooks Ferry, Cooks Ferry Indian Band office, um, which is right in the center of Spence's Bridge. And that takes a signal basically to bypass a mountain that's in the way of line of sight. So we're very dependent on having the power up and running at this system to either tell the pumps to turn on and off um, or to actually turn the pumps on and off um, with power to them. So the standby generator is quite um, important there. Another recommendation was to do some exploratory drilling for an alternate water source. The idea was to look for another well groundwater source on the north side of the Thompson. Um, in the Spences Bridge community area um, to both increase the, the yield and also reduce the reliance on one aquifer. So we do have three wells and it's the same as having three straws in one cup. So same aquifer, three wells um, that intercept that aqu aquifer. We have some looping recommendations on the North Frontage Road. So right now North Frontage Road is um, serviced on either end but not through the center of it. So it's, it's disconnected from each other. Um, you can see the red dashes here would be one of the proposed loops. So we dead end right here um, on the east 
end of the North Frontage Road, and then we dead end right here as well. Um, so this is one of the recommendations here. <clears throat> and then we also have the, the hydrant standpipes um, listed on here as well. So We also in Spence's Bridge have the original Murray Creek intake um, over here. And it was kept as a emergency backup. It would require significant work to put it into um, operation. However, if if the groundwater sources were diminishing, then we would we still have the option to make that a viable um, emergency um, use. And there, there's no treatment on that one. Um, there would be chlorination only. It would be subject to the same as the rest of our surface water sources where we would have uh, boil water notices. So the other the other thing that we are lacking in the Spences Bridge community water system is um, <clears throat> continuous online chlorine analysis and turbidity analysis, uh, which is typically a requirement, a condition on permit. So finding a location to to locate to put those or install those is um, is on the list of things to do. Right now, our wells. One of the important things to notice, and this goes back to the fire protection piece, but we do have a couple hydrants down here on this water main that are for flushing only. This water main fills is dedicated to filling the Spences Bridge Community Reservoir, and it isn't um, actually backfed by the community reservoir. So it comes in discharges at the top of the reservoir. It has static pressure. If a fire department ever hooked up to one of these hydrants, they're going to have flow for 15 seconds and then nothing. Um, so they, they are marked as flushing only, um, but the water gets pumped from the well field here all the way over to the community reservoir. And then from here, it comes back down through here, services IR4 and 4B, and then across the river and services the rest of Spence's Bridge and the remaining IRs. So, <clears throat> yes, uh, I guess one of the other things I wanted to mention about fire hydrants is they're not just for fighting fires. They are used for flushing and um, other things, um, cleaning pipes and whatnot. So <clears throat> another first one we have with two systems in the area, area I, Wallachine. So this was, this is 41 connections, population of around 95. Constructed in 1979, but acquired by the TNRD in 1978. Hmm. Um, <laughs> there, when I first did a tour of Wallachine, you could see the old wood stave pipe um, on the ground where they had replaced it with new water mains. So this is acquired and, and essentially reconstructed by the by the TNRD. Um, <clears throat> we have surface water with filtration and sodium hypochlorite disinfection. So again, we have Thompson River water and we have chlorine disinfection. We have a raw water reservoir, um, which is unusual for us. It's our only raw water reservoir in the TNRD. Um, so what that means is that we pump water from the river to a reservoir, store the raw water there, and then as customers open up their taps, that raw water flows through a treatment building, is filtered, is chlorinated, and then goes through their tap. So that makes it, it's essentially like an on-demand hot water system. It makes it very, very difficult to size and, and size a, a treatment facility, filtration facility particularly, for that um, flow rate, flow range. We can go from, you know, five liters per minute to um, 24 cubic meters per hour in if people turn on their sprinklers all at 6 p.m. So... And we've actually seen that happen where our filters, we use cartridge filtration here um, in this building. And those cartridges will collapse based on the, and they're, they're sized for that flow rate, but they, um, they will collapse and fail. And we often are, one of our more frequent calls is from Wallachine saying, I don't have water in my house, which means that our filters are plugged solid. So our guys go out there. So we've done a recent upgrade, thanks to gas tax to twin that filtration system and put online pressure monitoring on it. So we can monitor the differential pressure. That's the difference between the pressure entering the filter and leaving the filter, which gives us an indication of how plugged up that filter is. We can monitor that online. And we're at the, we're the stages of actually, um, I would say commissioning that the dual trains so that we can 
um, we can more proactively switch over from one train, one filtration train to the next to prevent those water outages, especially because they happen during high use times, irrigation season, um, which is when our guys like to take vacation on long weekends. I'm sure most other people like those long weekends off too. Director Smith, so, do you have a question? Yeah, just a quick question. And while Sheen there, so if there's not, the population is 95, does that 41 represent every house then? Yeah. Uh, so, or is there people on the uh, individual wells? No. So our, our, we have 41 connections. So is that every house in Walshie? It's not. It's, yeah. I, let me check this next slide. I'll, the, not every house, sorry, not every lot in Walshie is within the community water system. Um, but we use the 41 connections times 2.3 people per connection to get the population of 95. Um, Walshine is our unusual service area in that if you look at these orange lines, these are the, this is the service area. So it's a non-contiguous service area. There's a little orphaned lot over here. Um, there are lots along here with water main fronting them that aren't within the water system, the service area. Um, <clears throat> I don't believe there are any actual active houses in the, in Wallachine right there that aren't connected to the system though. So, um, we have 6.8 kilometers of water main here, um, 50 millimeter through 150. Most of it was installed in 1979 and the rest was installed in 2003 to 2006. So majority of it's PVC with the exception of some HGPE or high density polyethylene that is from our intake at the river and pumps up to our raw water reservoir all the way up here. Um, this line that goes out of the um, out of the picture is actually Jimmy's Creek. Uh, that's Jimmy's Creek right there. And that's that flows to us. We actually utilized that this fall um, for quite a period of time while we were dealing with a pump issue. Having a second source or a backup source is is really, um, really nice in that it gives you some time to deal with the issue um, adequately on the on the other um, source. So <clears throat> this one has some of the recommendations on this. Focus around the reservoir and that we have this, I believe it's CP uh, quarry here, and our water main runs right through it. So they use this for ballast for the railway. Um, and we have a reservoir up here with a, a great not all season access road um, that winds through the little hills. There's an awful lot of rock outcroppings in here, makes any sort of, and that's why they have a quarry there. There's a lot of rock. So it makes putting water mains in and stuff very, very challenging. So one of the recommendations in the new reservoir, and we're actually, we just received a, a planning grant to look at options and options assessment for this reservoir. So one of the master plan suggested putting it on um, crown land across the railway at a lower elevation to um, deal with the pressures. We are, are also looking at potentially putting it on land that we already own beside the pump house and using a booster skid similar to what we've installed in Evergreen um, to provide pressure to the to the system. So we're looking at that and that options assessment I'm hoping to have, have done this year. Uh, second intake and casing, when they put the intake in on the Thompson River, they put one casing into the river with one pump. And we, they had a second pump laying on the, not laying on the ground, but set aside as that was the backup. So in order to re, um, replace that pump, you had to pull all the, all the pipe out of the casing, out of the river and replace it. And one of those pictures I showed at the very beginning was the actual pump skid for Wallachine that was removed this year, three times. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Water main looping, this would open up some more, uh, serve, basically service more lots. This is more of a um, an idea for, it'd be paid for by development, um, for the water main looping, but here are the different options for it. A bunch of different streets in Wallachine that would service a lot more of the area. So right now we don't have a loop that comes up through here. The main loop would come across Wallachine Road um, rather than Barclay Street. 
down through here. So we add up here and we access these lots as well as um, the Sunny Mead Square and everything else in Wallachine. So we do get questions from uh, potential purchasers in Wallachine about, hey, can I get water to this lot? It's in the service area. And the answer is yes, you can, but our bylaw says that you are responsible for the cost of installing a water main across the frontage of your property if one does not exist. So they're looking at, you know, the hundred to two hundred thousand dollars to put water main in in a lot that is within a service area. So they are entitled to water, but they have to pay to get the water there. So that's um that's what this water main looping recommendation. Uh, that's what it's it's geared towards. <clears throat> All right, that's area I, area J, Savanaugh. So 290 connections, Savanaugh is our largest water system in the, in the TNRD um, portfolio. We have an approximate population of 660. So this actually puts us into the large drinking water uh, portfolio within Interior Health Authority, which puts us in with the, the Kamloops, the Salmon Arms, right? Um, the Chase, those municipalities. It's not a small water system like a a river shore might be, or a um, or a Lower Nicola Waterworks or uh, Thompson uh, View Estates, which would all be small water systems. So we're now in a large water system portfolio here in Savannah, which has more stringent requirements, and the um, yeah, a, lot of, a little bit more fun for us. So this was constructed in 1977, acquired in 2006 by the TNRD. Some quick notes on this. It is surface water with sodium hypochlorite disinfection. We've upgraded it in 1996, 2010, 2017. Um, we did the pump, that hatch uh, addition, another minor upgrade um, in 2022. So the picture on the top is the actual pump house. Um, we call it the high lift pump house in Savannah. And the picture on the bottom is the low lift. So the low lift, we have a, a, a pump in the lake. Um, this is surface water source again. So it's in the in Kamloops Lake. Um, pumps it through there into a clear well, which is, sits below the, the uh, pump house up top. And then we have vertical turbine pumps in the, in the high lift that pump the water to the reservoir. We do not have a dedicated water main um, or reservoir feed line here. This is the Savannah community water system um, infrastructure. So 12.6 kilometers of water main, uh, 50 millimeter through 600 millimeters. So we get into some, some bigger size pipe here. It's about 55% AC, 40% PVC. The remaining 5% is uh, galvanized. That stuff is, is pretty, pretty nasty after being installed in the 70s. Um, and we have some ductile and some HDPE as well in here. So we have a reservoir upgrade. Um, we've upgraded the intake and we've upgraded the contact chamber there. So our, our disinfection is adequate. However, we still lack filtration. We don't need 43210. Some of the recommendations here, again, reduce leakage and capture, capture consumption. Pretty uh, common theme for all of our water systems. A source of tap assessment. This will also inform our, our design for our water treatment plant, but this looks at our water source and the influences on it. A filtration system. We did complete a preliminary design for a filtration system, and we did this solely through um, basically deferring maintenance on our water system to save up enough money, $75,000, to do a preliminary design on a water treatment plant. It's a shelf-ready project. In 2021, I believe that was completed, and the price tag was 9.3 to 9.5 million dollars for a water treatment facility in Savannah. Um, so, in Vavenby, we have a five million dollar plant. In Savannah, we have a 10 to 12 million dollar plant. Now, um, we're looking for grant programs that will accommodate those. So, we look at things like what's the overall um, allowance for that grant program? Is it a hundred million dollar? intake or is it a $300 million intake? It might, it will influence um, which one we we recommend for, for moving forward. So, yeah. 
And, and just to add to that, something to keep in mind, and 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 later on, Tyrone will talk about the, the financial status of, of these systems. But uh, some of these systems, we've already gone to the communities for approved borrowing for capital infrastructure. So Savino is one of them where they're already paying parcel tax to pay off the amount of money we borrowed for the uh, reservoir upgrade. So when we're talking about a filtration plant, for example, um, and looking for a grant, often grants require funding. Um, you know, they may be an 80% grant and 20% needs to be funded by the area. But in this case, then that that 20% would be over and above what they're already contributing towards what's already borrowed for the reservoir. Um, so last time we had a community meeting there, that question, um, you know, unofficially through a straw poll was posed to the community is, you know, are you in favor of borrowing additional funds and having an additional parcel tax for a part for a, a water treatment plant? And it was an overwhelmingly, you know, no, they're not interested in paying more. So at this time, talking about grant options, we're limited to focusing on 100% grants for this specific, you know, treatment plant. So it further limits, you know, the opportunities of, of pursuing something like that. So the good news is <laughs> we have a shelf ready project. Um, if a grant program opens up that we that is suitable for this, we can dust it off with our, our consultant, uh, update our, our estimates and then apply. So we are we are making progress on, on some of these recommendations, um, but there's only so much we can do with the funding we have at this point. Uh, looping within the community core, this would replace some of the aging infrastructure that we have. We did apply for a grant for this and were declined. Um, and that looping within the community core plus some other piping work was a price tag of about three and a half million dollars we asked for, um, was not approved. So also some West End redundancy right now in Savannah, the West End, we have a single water main um, servicing everything to, to basically Vavasir Road. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so that can present some issues. These are some of the West Savannah. Karen, I just have a question on this system. Uh, there's a, uh, I think it's called the Watson subdivision in Savannah. And uh, has there been any discussions with the developer? Uh, and would that impact anything like looping or contribution towards things? So the the Watson Drive is part of the of the community water system at this point. Um, yeah, I don't. I'm not aware of any other development there. Uh, apparently, uh, uh, there's half the subdivision has been built. There's the other half that hasn't been built. So I don't know where the the pipes go, but it seems reasonable that a conversation with the developer on what would be required and what maybe participation in the system might be useful. I'm happy to arrange that. Uh, we get this meeting in Savannah on April 3rd, so he might be there, so. Yeah, so right now our current um, Watson Watson Drive here, and then Vista, it might be this chunk yeah. that you're talking about. Yeah, so that would be, if the developer wanted to access the water system, they would be responsible for all the costs associated with putting a water main through here according to our bylaw, as well as any potential um, increases in capacity, uh, the work that would be required for that. So, and we actually have a, a similar development works agreement in Pritchard for the new Osprey development there, um, which I'll talk about after. Um, West End redundancy, this was a, this is some of the, this is actually the water main upgrade that we applied for. Um, some of the the work there. Um, showing the the high water mark, uh, two hundred year floodplain uh, levels and everything else in here, and where our water mains currently run. So it'd be bringing them down this way, looping them here. Right now in Savannah, we have quite a few water mains that run in these little alleys, and there's always encroachment um, on these right of ways or these alleyways. We've even had requests to close laneways um, that we haven't supported because our water mains run there so people can can amalgamate lots but it is it is challenging both on on that side as well as the operational side so 
Uh, moving on to area L, this is Del Oro Community Water System. So 42 connections there, I believe it's actually 43. We have a population of approximately 97, constructed in 1972, acquired by the TNRD in 2001. It is surface water, so this is the South Thompson River with sodium hypochlorite dis disinfection. There's large parcel sizes here and significant irrigation use, which you guys, um, which I'll show a little bit later on. But here, this is on Whitner Road, this intake. Um, we have two buildings here. This building in the foreground is the disinfection building and where our controls are. And then there's a building in behind on the riverbank where our pump is and our water main is um, and the controls for that pump. So this shows our, our Whitner Road intake and pump station. And then we cross the highway and the railway tracks and service the Del Oro community um, on the south side of the, of the um, Trans-Canada Highway. So it's a, a dedicated water main to the reservoir. Um, and then it's fed from the reservoir back down to the community with basically two branches. Um, it's a teed. Uh, distribution network. So 1.5 kilometers of water main, um, 150 and 200 millimeter. Most of it was installed in 1972. We have four hydrants in here. However, we have inadequate pressure for fire flows. So the pressure in the water system is dictated by the elevation of the reservoir. If you'd like to increase the pressure to make this ready for fire flows, then you need to put a new reservoir in at a higher elevation. And we're restricted by the a railway right away above us as well to make matters even better i guess um we don't have legal access to our reservoir for vehicles we can walk to it um over the water main right away that we have but we do not have vehicle, vehicular access to this reservoir um, which really restricts the operations that we can perform on this reservoir so we can and this this reservoir also the configuration of it has these uh these filter or sorry these uh I want to call them silk curtains but they're it's baffled with curtains um fabric curtains in it which makes it also really challenging to clean um or even inspect with an rov so you can bring up uh, an rov put it in the reservoir no one has to access it um inspect it but you get tangled up and disturb stuff and then you have to retrieve it somehow so even to get a diving team in there to, to clean this reservoir is cost prohibitive at this point. Um, so there are definitely some challenges here. So some of the recommendation, recommendations from the master planning were water metering and conservation, simply because this there's huge um, irrigation use in this community. Um, <clears throat> intake, intake upgrade to accommodate low river levels just this year. In fact, we've had to lower the pump in the river in the intake by two feet just to prevent cavitation and maintain flows to the community. So the South Thompson River is dropping in level and it is impacting our ability to access the water. A filtration system, again, we're straight off surface water here with no filtration, we add chlorine and that's it. Um, so they are at, um, during fresh at, we're on a boil water notice and for quite a bit of the year, we're on a water quality advisory. So. I'm expecting any day now that we'll be issuing buoyant alerts um, to the communities that we're putting on water quality advisories and boil water notices based on the water quality from the surface water sources. So uh, preliminary design for this filtration plant is estimated around $75,000. We've, we've managed to do them for that amount. Um, with inflation, I'm not sure that we will be able to continue that, but to fund this, um, we will have to find money in the operation budget to set aside for this um, this design. And we've been working on our on our five year plans to accommodate these large chunks um, that we need. And then reservoir access and the improvements to the reservoir. So we do require a statutory right of way for access to the reservoir, and then we can put improvements on that statutory right of way. Um, so we have a historical route that comes up the driveway of 630 Durango Drive. Um, as you can see, it goes right past their pool in their backyard. It is fairly intrusive, not going to argue that. Um, comes across this property, 
to this property, another few properties to our reservoir. Right now we have a footpath down here. That's a pretty steep slope. I even threw the idea to, to um, Jake back um, a few years ago. Uh, what if we built a ramp from Durango over our right of way? Um, I would probably rather deal with a 20 foot ferry um, and have vehicle access to our reservoir than not have vehicle access. And I think our slope, our mid, our max slope was still like 26% crate. So it's still just not feasible to, to get to it that way. Um, even walking up there, um, I'm out of breath when I get up there. So, <laughs> uh, but I do sit at a desk a lot of the time. So, uh, <laughs> Yes, we have a we do have a right of way on the property where the where the reservoir is, and we have a right of way where the water mains are, and then the majority of the water mains and all of our water systems are within the Ministry of Transport right of way for roads. So we don't have a security issue that way. It's more of access to most of these, similar to Vaven B Reservoir. We actually put a road into the Vaven B Reservoir, and got a permit over Crown land for that. So this one happens to be challenging because we have. I think it's nine property owners that we would have to negotiate with to um, procure a right of way for this. So, but the hard part, and you can see the, the contour lines here is the contours of this. This is a very, very steep bank and there's only one, maybe two potential ways to get up here. So either way, coming up this driveway, that's already a pretty steep driveway. Um, and then maybe coming across this parcel and to bypass their backyard here for these residents and get onto this elevation. The, the historical road is already in here. It was decommissioned in this area by the property owner. So even if we come up their driveway and come across, there's still a fair bit of work to do to, to access it. So we don't have any practical vehicle access right now to that reservoir. Yeah, we can put a pad in, that's pretty cheap. It's a helicopter that's expensive. <laughs> Um, there's 42 customers on here. They pay $1,200 a year for water each. That's our budget. So what, a helicopter is going to eat up their budget. <laughs> <Right? laughs> no, I know, but like well, 42 hours for the helicopter time. Yeah. That's about it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Just, so we have a week's worth of work, then we'll shut the water off. Just a general question on all of these water systems. Um, are, do you have a water tariff for each of these communities or how does that work? Yeah, so we have a, a bylaw, um, I believe it's bylaw number 2757 for the uh, rates for the all the water systems. So if, if we're trying to organize access and there's a cost associated with that, it falls back on the community through the tariff? Yes, so anything that we, the work that we do for the community is paid for by the water rates and the tariffs for that community. Um, and we'll talk about this more in the next presentation on the on the financial piece. Um, but any if I hire a contractor to go out there and dig something, Del Oro Community Water System, the line item repair and maintenance line item has to pay for that. So that fifteen hundred dollar dig comes out of that um, pot of money for that system. It's not Savannah paying for it. It's not, you know, Loon Lake paying for it. It's Del Oro paying for it. Same as if you do any work in, in Savannah or any of these community systems are paid for by that community system. The best way um, I've heard it explained is that each utility has its own separate bank account. So the money goes into that bank account and I don't take money out of your bank account. You don't take it out of mine. So um, that's the simplest, most simplistic explanation of, of the funding here. So um, anyway, so we have some work to do. Um, this isn't the only right of way that we have our access issue we have in the TNRD. Uh, moving on to area O, Maple Mission Community Water System. This is a, a very small system, 24 connections, about 55 people, very large parcels as well, has a single well, um, constructed in 1996, so it's fairly new. And we acquired this in 2005. We have a single well source here, which is always a um, redundancy is is king in in utilities. Um, when one thing fails, you turn it off and then turn the other one back on, and go and fix the other one when you have the the time. Um, the faster you try and do stuff, the more expensive it is too. So, 
Uh, this is groundwater with, with chlorine disinfection. So this is another system that uh, almost meets our, our conditions on permit. We do have some a GARP assessment to complete and um, some other stuff. So we have 2.9 kilometers of water main, 100, 150 millimeter PVC since 1996. We have one hydrant here, four standpipes, one pressure reducing valve. So we do have quite an elevation change between the reservoir and the very last service. Um, there is a pressure reducing valve in the system to reduce that pressure uh, below 90 PSI um, to service uh, the homes down below. Our PRV has failed. It does need to be serviced. We need to complete a confined space assessment of this um, small little manhole uh, in order to get in there. We can, we have a, a procedure to go in there and adjust the piloting and maintain the pilot piloting. So the small valves of this of this large control valve. The issue we have is that we, with work safe regulation changes and confined spaces, we don't have the ability to double block and bleed this space. So we can't safely access it and remove that four inch um, PRV because of the threat of the danger of flooding that space and trapping a person. So. We need to come up with a solution for that. And that also costs money. Um, it's on our list of things to do, which you'll probably hear from me a lot. Uh, we have a lot of competing priorities in, the, in these systems. So some of the recommendations here were water metering and conservation, that's complete. A hydrogeologic study, this would be to explore for another well, another water source, a uh, new production well, so this, the current well was installed in 1996 and has been in production since. That's nearing the end of its life. Um, so do we put money towards fixing a PRV or do we put money towards a hydrogeologic study to find another source um, here? Those are the kind of choices we have to make on the operations side and where the funding goes to. Uh, reservoir improvements, we've had issues with the reservoir icing up and our level sensors don't read through ice. Um, and the ice doesn't move when it <laughs> when the water level drops. The ice stays there, so it looks like our reservoir level is the same, which we haven't run out of water. Um, but it's just another operational consideration for our staff is to deal with ice in a in a reservoir. Uh, moving on to black pines area P. This is the the bulk of the presentation coming up. Uh, <laughs> so black pines. Now we get into some some more of our, our significant capital projects are occurring in area P. So I'll be a little bit quicker on these ones. We have 42 connections of Black Pines. This was constructed in 1975, acquired by the TNRD in 1995. Currently, we have our source right there in the North Thompson River. This source is slowly being cut off by a gravel or sandbar that's being um, deposited. And we have the other thing that we have in Black Pines is we have large parcel sizes and varying use. So we do have hobby farms out there, and then we have single residential family um, properties out there. So there's a it's a mixed um, community that way. So we have two and a half kilometers of water main, mostly PVC installed in 1996, seven hydrants, five standpipes. Uh, we have our reservoir. The center picture is our solar system, solar power system that we put up at the reservoir to power the, um, the radio that communicates the levels. The picture on the top right was from this November, I think right November 10th when we had the, uh, the instant freeze up. It actually froze our pump in the intake and we lost our water um, to Black Pines. We put a water uh, temporary pump down that bank, uh, heat traced it and tied it into the water system and are still operating on that right now. Um, we've been out there four times to thaw it out. Every time we get something that drops below about minus 12 and a wind, uh, when this is exposed, even with the heat chase, heat tra trace and the insulation, it still freezes up. Um, yeah, we've pretty much narrowed it down to where the brass couplings we've used because we had 100 foot rolls of, of, uh, two inch muni tubing that we put down here and we needed three of those rolls. To get it down there so each of those brass couplings when they're exposed to the low temperatures tend to freeze the the water right there so uh that's been some operational fun for us <laughs> uh, yeah 
Uh, but what, what we are doing is we, um, we're putting a new water source in for Black Pine. So this is a quite the historical project here. Um, we were successful in getting a, a grant back in 2015 for a new intake for Black Pines. But we, we got that grant without um, getting public assent for the one third of the costs that the residents were, were responsible for. The residents declined the one third for a new um, water intake. So we re revamped the scope, um, went back to the province, for the grant, um, did a scope change on it, did some exploration for groundwater, secured a right of way, did some exploratory drilling. Um, and then we finally got public assent from the residents for a new groundwater source in 2021. And we also experienced significant delays due to flooding and land ownership issues. Um, production well was completed in November, 2021. Engineering contract for design and construction was awarded in 2022, February, 2022. We started, we tendered the construction contract in August, 22, 2022. We started construction in October, 2022. And currently the building and the piping are complete. Um, mechanical within the pump house is underway. We are waiting on electrical at this point and the pitless adapters are being installed this week. The pitless adapters um, connect these wells to the pump house and to the distribution system. So those were a significant delay on this project um, and they're scheduled for this week to be installed. So unfortunately I received a, a two week look ahead on this project uh, after I already put this together. So we do have delays with electrical and HVAC components. Our HVAC um, or heating and ventilation those components, exhaust fans for our, our chlorine room are supposed to be here May 9th. Um, but the the rest of the, the building and the project will be ready to go prior to that. So we're looking at around Easter to um, hopefully commission this, this system and get off of the surface water and go to groundwater. So one of the fun things about the groundwater is that we've done some preliminary assessments on the groundwater and it looks much better quality than the surface water. However, we haven't been running the groundwater at all, so we don't know what we're going to find. We have provisions for future treatment for iron and manganese um, issues, but just because we're putting groundwater in doesn't mean that we won't have any treatment to, to perform in the future on this system. However, we will have a pretty secure source. So another area P water system, this is Evergreen. This is our smallest water system. In the TNRD, we have 16 connections. This actually borders the city of Kamloops boundary to the north just by Hefley. And this was constructed in 1982 and acquired by the TNRD in 2000. It's a shallow well. The picture on the left shows the North Thompson River with our well, shallow well building pump house. Um, and we disinfect with sodium hypochlorite. We use a booster system to maintain pressure in this. There used to be about a 20 foot long hydro pneumatic tank in that building. We did an upgrade from gas tax two years ago now and replaced that failing hydro pneumatic tank with a very small um, duplex booster pump skid um, that works quite well. And we actually put backup power in for it um, too. So we have two properties in Evergreen, two of the 16 that if we had um, if the booster station failed, would not have water. Um, there's not adequate pressure to service their homes. That's why we have a booster station here. Um, this, going back to the fire protection thing, this entire community is, um, sorry, it's all four inch PVC within the community. So you can't get fire flows through four inch PVC. If they wanted fire protection here with hydrants, they'd have to upgrade the entire distribution network. So. Um, we've achieved a base level of service as far as dis distributing water, but to get fire protection, if the residents wanted to pay for it, it'd be a significant cost. So, um, <clears throat> right here, we have one and a half kilometers of that PVC four inch main, and then we have 500 meters of, of ductile that is our railway crossing. So, our intake is in a great spot here, and I say that sarcastically because. It sits on the banks of the North Thompson River. And to the east, we have a railway and then a um, significant highway, Highway 5 there. 
So it's pretty isolated. We also have no access, um, no legal access to this to this res or to this intake. So in the case of Del Oro, we have no access to our reservoir. In the case of Evergreen, we have no access to our intake, our source. Um, yeah. So right now we have a, um, I guess, a verbal agreement with the landowner to essentially walk across the property to access it, um, which makes uh, it challenging to get any equipment in there and do significant maintenance. So, yeah, I mean, boats and stuff like that would, like, you thought Del Oro didn't have any money. You got 16 customers here. <laughs> <laughs> and these 16 are paying $1,500 a year for, for water. Um, that property is, yes. Uh, the development itself was, uh, I'm not sure who the previous developer was, but this was one that is, I have a better story for Pritchard on how we acquired it, but this, we didn't, and, sorry, but we didn't, inher we inherited these because they failed. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Does the property owner uh, where you don't have the easement, is he a customer as well? No, he's not. So he doesn't need this system. That's the issue. That's correct. Um, so some of the recommendations here, water meter and conservation. So this is outskirts of Kamloops. Um, they're fairly large properties. They're, some of them are cross fence for horses. Um, there's some, there's some awfully nice properties up there. Everyone likes to keep stuff green. Um, and they're all, especially now focused on fire smarting their, their properties and keeping things, um, from basically burning. So water meter and conservation is, is important there, especially with our, our lack of access for a source, um, the communication upgrades. So we do have, we, and we've done this upgrade now where there's a single, um, copper line that ran with the water main from the intake on the North Thompson under the tracks, under the highway, all the way up to the booster station that would tell our pumps to turn on and off based on our reservoir level. So we've actually put in a couple of cellular modems that now do the communication. We have the, um, the copper line as a backup, still functions. Um, but in my previous experience, those, you can put six pairs of lines in the ground and you'll end up with two you know, or one pair after 20 years. So they do fail, they do break. Um, so we've we've done that communication upgrade so we don't have to walk across the property and manually turn a pump on to put, to put water there. So again, that was a gas tax uh, funded upgrade that went with the booster station. Water source, so we need to secure access to our existing intake or and or explore for a potential well within the existing service area. There is a customer in our service area that does have a, a decent well um, with, with, with good um, um, production. And so there, there is potential for that. However, um, exploring for groundwater is expensive and you might drill a dry hole and basically pour all your money down there, never to be seen again. So it's a, it's a risky endeavor, um, especially with the, the limited funding that we operate with here. Uh, the treatment is totally source dependent. So if we if we stick with the if we can secure access to our intake, then we're treating water from the from the North Thompson essentially. It's slightly influenced by the North Thompsons and often supplemented in August by the North Thompson. Um, if we drill for groundwater, then we don't know what type of water we're going to have to treat. So there was no actual um, dollar figure put towards treatment for that because it is solely source dependent. All right, moving on to Pritchard. <clears throat> So we have 169 connections in Pritchard with a population of 375. The connections have actually increased because we had a development works agreement with this property on the east. Um, this is now developed um, first and second phase, I believe. That's what we call the Osprey development. And they are serviced as well. That's a single service for that development. It is a strata. So our responsibility ends at the property line. We have a six inch meter on that property that also allows for fire flows um, if we can achieve those in the future. So some of the history of Pritchard is developer built in 1971 and 72. It operated under a CPCN, which is a certificate of public convenience and necessity. 
um, until 1993 when it was taken over by the province. Management by the province occurred due to failure by the utility to establish and maintain a maintenance reserve fund. In uh, 1999, the province made representation to the TNRD to have the TNRD take it over and the TNRD accepted it because we took on, or because we already had a sanitary sewer system in the same area. So not only do we have a water system servicing Pritchard, we also have a sanitary sewer system servicing Pritchard. So this is the typical um, example of what happens with these, these water systems and how we end up acquiring them. I know I wrote acquired these systems, but um, they are essentially given to us, like Jamie mentioned for a buck. Um, and we probably overpaid. <laughs> So, <laughs> but, um, you know, like when we take over these things in 1999, we didn't have the 43210 objectives at that time either. So now we have regulations that change and put increased um, requirements on us as the purveyor and owner of these. So that's, how do we manage that? And it went to the province because they couldn't establish a maintenance reserve fund, which tells you that they already couldn't pay to, um, to put money away to replace the water mains and the infrastructure that they had at that time, um, getting to the point where we build a water treatment plant here to establish a reserve fund to cover both the distribution and the treatment facility is also going to be a challenge uh, for these 169 customers, 170 if you include Osprey. So we have an awful lot of AC water mains in here. Um, and we have very corrosive soils in Pritchard. So I didn't, I don't think I put any of the pictures on here, but I've done them at previous operational updates. We just show some of the fittings and they're just great big clumps of, of rust um, and deteriorated and gone. We've seen them where the, on the dual or the single strap saddle, the strap has just disappeared, um, the corrosive soil. So we use, when we put, we did put some hydrants in here, did an upgrade through gas tax again and replace the four blow-offs or standpipes in the system with four hydrants at the at the ends. They allow for better flushing. Um, we put cathodic protection on those because of the soils and the cor corrosive, corrosive soils. Getting to the point where I can't say a lot of these words anymore. Um, so this is our this is our big news is that Pritchard, we had a, a water treatment facility. So we applied for grant funding and we were approved in July 2020. It was 100% um, senior government uh, funded, so zero dollars from the taxpayer, four point nine, four nine, four nine, one million dollars. Um, this is great news. So we did an engineering request for proposals. We issued that September twenty twenty. We awarded that contract for the design and construction services to WSP in November twenty twenty. The preliminary design was completed in in May twenty twenty one. We did a membrane equipment supply and delivery request for proposals in June 2021. And we selected the supplier in October 2021. So we we have secured pricing for the equipment um, for the plant. And this allowed us to then complete detailed design of a water treatment plant for Pritchard, uh, which ran from November 2021 through to October 2022. So we're now a year um for just detailed design so then we tendered this in october 11th 2023 which closed november 9th 2023 we have sorry 2022 it closed on the future yeah i thought i changed that sorry i'll make a note um sorry we october yeah in 2022 we tendered and um we had 4.28 million dollars left available for construction our tender results low bid water plant only 5.1 million dollars low bid for the water plant and intake we had two different intake options ranged between 5.3 and 6.4 million dollars and our tender results for all the work that we wanted to do was ranged between 6.4 and 7.3 million depending on which intake option we went with our tender prices came in 2.1 million to 3 million dollars higher than available funding we don't have any more funding. Um, so why did we tender this? Our engineer's opinion of probable cost on October 5th, 2022, which is a class A estimate from our engineer was $4.385 million, 
which is about $105,000 more than what we had, which we can probably find. So we tendered it based on, on believing that it was going to be a $4.3 million project. And it came in $2.1 to $3 million higher than, than what it was. So what's next? Um, oh. We're reviewing the feasibility of, of continuing with this with this project. Um, what can we cut from it? What can we what can we do with it to put some sort of to make use of this 100% grant fund that we received? So this is a um, like this was July 2020 until now that this all happened, um, and yeah, it was just I don't know. Trying to figure out what exactly happened. I'll let Jamie elaborate. Yeah, I guess just to add to that, when he said we're reviewing it, we are reviewing it with a different engineering team uh, because there was obviously some issues that are obvious in the story now that we tell it, that that we show it and you know to its full extent. But at the time, um, you know, we were we were expecting that um, you know we could have confidence in that that estimate, and obviously it was is off so we're having a second opinion to review and and try to give us the answer of what went sideways why why was this so off director smith sure. director smith I'm just wondering if you had any opportunity to maybe talk to donald trump's people about mm -hmm. this he, he seems to be able to handle this sort of item all the whole time I'll defer to Jamie on that one. <laughs> okay, so that's uh, that's Pritchard. We were very, very excited to get this grant to put in our first membrane filtration plant. And now we're at a bit of a holding pattern at this point while we look at our options. So. Jumping into the CSS, this is a community sewer system. Uh, I prefer to call it wastewater, but, um, and they call them reclamation facilities now. Uh, no one likes sewage, I guess, uh, perception. But we, this is a uh, first system actually that the TNRD, we actually constructed this. So the water systems we haven't constructed, but the wastewater systems we have. So this was again, 169 connections, population of 375, constructed in 1996. It's a trickling filter. Um, has sand filters, ultraviolet disinfection, and rapid infiltration basins. The infiltration basins are pictured right here. The effluent, once it's disinfected, filtered and disinfected, go travels through these infiltration basins through a gravel seam and ends up into the South Thompson River. And we have a fairly um, comprehensive monitoring program for that. And we didn't touch on this yet, but our sewer systems are regulated by the Ministry of Environment. And they are, they currently operate under a um, permit to operate. So there's a new municipal wastewater regulation. However, our systems predate that, and we still use the permit to operate. So which outlines all the requirements for us for monitoring, for effluent quality, for operations, and what's allowed to be um, put in that place. So, just a question: any uh, any evidence of leakage through test uh, through test monitoring wells? between the river and the infiltration? Um, so the infiltration basins are designed to actually um, convey the wastewater to the river. So once it's treated, yeah. So it's treated in the, uh, the plant. Um, just a couple more quick details and I'll show you some more pictures of the stuff. But we have 2.8 kilometers of gravity sewer mains in here, 35 manholes, one lift station. Basically everything in Pritchard gravity flows to a lift station here that gets pumped up to the wastewater treatment plant. And the development works agreement put a water a sewer main as well in here that gravities back to the pump station, which then goes back into the, um, the wastewater plant. So uh, we added headworks to the process um, to the wastewater plant. We replaced the UV disinfection system. So the original UV disinfection system is really challenging to get parts for. A new UV system was put in. The control panel for that UV system was inadequate and failed. So one of the gas tax projects we did in 2019, we completed this, was to build a new control panel. That UV system works great now. Um, one of the cool things we put on here, because it, this is in the on the plant floor, 
and exposed to all the um, sewer gases and everything else and a highly corrosive environment, we actually have a little air conditioning unit on here to um, condition the air within that control panel. So it's um, much better product now. And then rapid infiltration base and repairs. So our issue wasn't so much um, getting, you know, water to, our issue was not being able to get the treated wastewater to the river. Um, as you can see here, there, there have been multiple attempts at this issue, but our RI basin right here um, has a gravel seam below it that's supposed to get to the river. That where it daylights or exits in the river it gets silted up and um, we don't have enough hydraulic force to overcome that silt and push that water through. So those, those actually become ponds. They're not supposed to be ponds. Um, after a few different projects to, to fix this issue, originally it was thought that the road was the blockage. The repair was done to, to open up that. Okay, it turns out it's not the road. What's next? Look at a few other things. So the latest one we did, um, and completed, and this was another gas tax project, uh, was to put a, an additional layer um, riprap here. So take this gravel seam that follows the contours of the riverbank, tie into that, bring it out, daylight it right in this area on the river, in the riparian area, um, rehabilitate the riparian area. And then if this river discharge point gets plugged up and won't transport the wastewater, then it will daylight through there. And it's um, received a couple of phone calls last summer from residents wondering where all the water went because now the ducks have nowhere to swim. Um, <laughs> said back in 1997, it looks like what it did then. So um, it's supposed to be dry and it worked. This is the process um, of the wastewater treatment plant. We have the river road lift station on the left. We have our headworks unit. Then we have three settling tanks. And then we have a trickling filter. This trickling filter, we have multiple pumps that pass the wastewater over top of this trickling filter. The treatment occurs there. And then uh, we add some chemicals to remove phosphorus. We use a clarifier to settle out the solids. Liquids go out to a sand filter. More solids get removed. Then the liquids, minus the solids, go through UV and out to the RI basins. The solids are then passed back into one of the settling tanks and essentially recirculated through the system until they're removed by a vacuum truck or a septic truck. So one of our uh, projects we're doing right now, this thing was built in 1996. We have some significant corrosion issues. It is at the end of its life, but we're looking at the feasibility of rehabilitating the existing system or upgrading the process. So this is a picture of the existing containment unit on the trickling filter. It's white um, in most of the places, but not all. And there are places where you can just poke your finger through that um, sheeting that's designed to contain the, the wastewater um, and the multimedia that's in there, prevent splashing and whatnot. What's happening right now is that the, the wastewater is making its way through it, splashing, causing condensation issues um, and corrosion issues within the plant. So one of the options we're looking at is convert the primary tank into an equalization tank, remove the trickling filter and replace it with submerged membranes in that same tankage there. We have an awful lot of tankage in this system. And then adding membranes would eliminate the clarifier and the sand filters. Sand filters are an issue for us. Every two years, we are rehabilitating them, uh, both the under drain and replacing the media. And um, so this is a, a feasibility study that we're doing right now. Um, on this to see what we're where we're going to end up. We are we've been unable to. This system hasn't met permit twelve months of the year for probably a decade. So it's only a, a like and Ministry of Environment would like to see us moving forward on some with some plans and some solutions. Um, and this is why we are are pursuing these <clears throat> assessments here. So and then Paul Lake. So Paul Lake was established, excuse me, in 1994, 110 connections, two and a half kilometers of, of gravity mains, just under one kilometer of pressure mains, one lift station. So this services the south side of Paul Lake. And all these homes are built on, on steep ground. 
with um, and not very suitable for septic systems. So the community wastewater system was created and installed. It's the picture on the right there shows our lift station that pumps all the wastewater collected to the wastewater treatment plant, which is pictured on the left. That's the uh, that's the guts of the plant, the RBC. Um, the other interesting thing about this system is that all these properties had septic systems uh, previous to the community system going in. So what was done was that the effluent from the septic tanks uh, is now put into the into the sewer mains that allowed them to put in four inch sewer mains instead of eight inch, uh, four and six inch sewer mains instead of eights that you normally see in a, in a gravity system, simply because the solids are retained in the septic tanks. And as part of the servicing um, agreement, the TNRD is responsible for removing the solids from the septic tanks uh, for each individual homeowner. And we do that on a five, the recommendation was five to eight year rotation. So we've switched from doing all of them every five years to doing about a, a quarter of them every year um, and then getting the stragglers on year five. What it's also driven that change is that um, hauling costs have, have more than tripled in the last three years. So um, the sludge that we haul is hauled to the city of Kamloops and the city of Kamloops increased their tipping fees um, to the point where we used to be able to um, haul all of these for about 18 to $20,000. And now we spend $9,000 a year for 20 tanks. So um, yeah, those are some of the, <clears throat> the issues that we are running into as far as, as budgeting and, and finances go on these. So some of the recommendations were to get a spare RBC for redundancy. So these aren't this rotating biological contactor, which is covered in boat wrap to protect it from UV, is currently sitting on stands adjacent to the existing RBC. These aren't off-the-shelf products. That was a six-month um, delivery. So we purchased one of those through our gas tax again, and now it's sitting there waiting for <clears throat> to replace the existing RBC. RBCs don't slowly fail. They have catastrophic failures where the shaft holding the media just breaks. And then your whole thing is in the tank. You have to fish it out, put a new system in and go. So if that happened, we'd be bypassing our, our treatment system. We'd be in contravention of our permit to operate. And we'd most likely foul up our disposal field, um, <clears throat> which is basically non-repairable. You're plugging up all the, the pores in the ground you'd have to go and put a whole new disposal field in, which is not good. Uh, washroom building and water supply. So this was a satellite system um, that was never, uh, it, it wasn't, I guess, accommodated in the, during the design and construction of it to put um, any facilities at this location. And with requirements now, you have to have facilities. So we put a well in, um, put a, use gas tax again for a well, and for an addition to the building, which provided some storage space and some some water for us to not only wash down, like wash our hands when we're done in the sewer plant, um, but also to wash down equipment and, and materials and, and whatnot there. So uh, duplex filtration. So we have an RBC to a clarifier, and then it goes through a sand filter. So the uh, redundancy again, put a, a second filtration system in. And then increase our equalization sludge storage capacity, which we've done through, we've worked on, it's kind of a band-aid, but um, equalization through a lift station upgrade, which was our <clears throat> part of our control system upgrade. And so this allows us to control the level in our lift station to essentially act as a, as a small equalization tank. So that's what we've done as our most recent upgrade at Paul Lake. This was picture taken two weeks ago, a uh, new pump going in with a new level sensor showing there. So that was it for our overview of our community of water and sewer systems. Maybe we'll stop here. What, uh, what does the timing look like? Uh, yeah. Through the water meters and the financial graph. Yes, yeah, so, so we um, we know there's probably a lot of questions here, so we could just pause for a minute. Um, we do have a section we wanted to update ar around water meters, and then also section 5.3 in the agenda is the financial status of TNRD utility systems. So I think um, both of those are important updates um, that should have a you know a decent amount of time allocated to them. And then, and there's also I'm assuming questions about Tyrone's presentation we just had. So um, and I'll put it to the chair to 
you know, think about how we want to deal with this. We could consider calling an additional meeting sometime this spring to deal with section 5.3 on the agenda. Um, that's a very important piece that needs to be discussed in detail. Does it make sense to directors to hear the balance of the presentation and then schedule another meeting? Like, How long do you think it'll take to go through the remaining sections? The water meter piece will be 15 minutes. Okay. And, and what, if, what do the directors think about scheduling another meeting or digesting all of this stuff? <laughs> So let's let's complete the water meter presentation and then maybe we schedule another meeting if we could tie it into some of our board meetings. Uh, and uh, What's that? That might be it, it may be tricky to tie it into another one of our board meetings because it was um, it was quite the challenge putting together the board calendar for the year, but we can absolutely find another time. It just may mean you coming in a, a, you know a second week. Um, in addition to being at a board meeting the week before. We always try our best to, to align it with an existing board meeting, but given the number of other committee meetings we have, it might be a challenge. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to staff to yep, schedule will... a meeting, but we're talking millions of dollars of commitment. And I don't think that we can, we certainly can't do it after the 15 minute TNRD water meeting presentation. I think we got a lot of questions and a lot. Oh of yeah, absolutely. Digest. Yeah, fully in support of scheduling a different meeting. Just letting you know that it may be not as convenient um, for some of you. That's all. Thank you. And, and we get look at some options right now and bring them back after Tyrone's Dennis presentation. What do you mean? Okay. All right. So TNRD water meters. In 2018, we received a UBCM grant of $3.4 million for metering all of our community water systems. The initial plan was for 68% of the meters to be installed at the property line. That means that we put them in meter pits rather than in the house. And this allows us to capture the water that any leakage that's between the, um, basically the, the custody point. So we are, the TNRD is responsible for water up to the property line. Um, once this, the service lines within the private property are responsibility of the homeowner. So, we looked at trying to get about two thirds at the property line. Uh, the goals of this project, these weren't all of them, but these were the main ones, mm -hmm. leak reduction, equitable, build, equitable billing and water conservation. Public meetings were held with each community prior to the installation. Uh, the strategy was adjusted due to the pandemic. So we had to put a pause on in-house meter installs. Um, People weren't crazy about us coming inside to install water meters when they weren't allowed to go outside because of COVID. So <clears throat> as of April, 2022, all 1,050 meters were installed in the TNRD. Our final ratio is 83% at property line and 17% at house. So I think we did fairly well to capture um, the majority of the water at the property line. And um, I, it really, really helps with identifying the leakage. So which is this next one. So this is Blue River. It's an example of, of some of the benefits, these next three little graphs I'm just gonna show you. In Blue River, we had our average day was 800 cubic meters of water for a population of around 200 people. Um, our, that meant our reservoir, this is where it impacts the rest of the operations. Our reservoir storage was down to about uh, 10, about 10 hours at best. So the power goes out, you wait for hydro to say, oh, it's gonna be a four hour fix. And you don't start going up there with a generator already. By the time hydro extends it to an eight hour outage, you're not there in time, you run out of water, which happened to us. Um, it's a tough decision to make whether to send that generator or not. It's uh, a significant cost or was before we purchased one to send a contractor and everything up there to go install one just to get turned around. The first time we did it, we got turned around a little fort, power is back on. Second time we did it, we got there seven hours after the water ran out. So um, those are some of the operational decisions we have to make that we also get to, to wear. So, um, but the point of this, our water meters were installed at the end of 20, well, March, 2021 in Blue River. Right away, we noticed our leaks, found the, a significant leak, started reducing them and fixing them. And in that period of time of three months, we took our, 
our daily flows from 800 cubic meters down to about 230 cubic meters a day, which then allows gives us about 40 hours, almost 40 hours of storage in our reservoir. That gives us more time to make those decisions on whether to send a generator up there or not um, and what actions to take. So that was that was huge. In Vavenby, um, this is an example of, of individual leaks and kind of our, our philosophy on, on addressing them. So the, the black line shows the system flow. So 250 to 280 cubic meters a day in Vave and B. This is a 10 day period. We had two major leaks, leak number one in blue, leak number two in orange. The yellow is, is, is a um, sum of all the other leaks that we can see on these on these water meters. So we addressed those two leaks, left the rest of them, which are small, 40 liters a, an hour kind of thing. And we took our average down to about 85 cubic meters per day, and we're still at that. Um, so we've made significant progress in Vave and B as well, which also allows us to size a water treatment plant appropriately when we know that we're not putting all of our water right back into the ground. We use Deloro last as our consumption. This was an example of, this was actually a, somewhat surprising to me. We had assumed leakage in the 25 to 50% range for most of our systems. Deloro, the, the, uh, the gray line is what we pump through the system and meter through the system. And the blue line is what goes through every customer's meter. Um, now you, when you pump the water to the to a reservoir, you don't necessarily like it's it's hard to get a, a perfect match. So if you look at the red line, that's our public leakage, and the uh, axis on the right zero, we're actually running around 0.9 to one percent public side leakage in Del Oro. It's a very very what we call a very tight system. So um, that was really cool to see that with the with the water meters. Um, that's the kind of information it, it shows us there. So then. Once those meters are in and we start as the as the operations group, we get to um, deal with the public side leaks, try and reduce our what we call non-revenue water because we don't um, sell any water that goes right back into the ground, not through a meter, isn't paid for, non-revenue. It's a waste of, of, of resources. So we, we updated the, the rates bylaw November 18, 2021, which allowed for a mock billing period. So this mock billing would let us send out four quarters of water bills. So each customer re would receive their flat rate bill and a mock bill for this for the period. And they could see what their bills, water bills would be if they were paying for a metered rate versus a flat rate. <clears throat> so we <clears throat> completed mock billing for select communities in Q1 of 2022 and the rest of the mock, mock billing with the exception of Loon Lake. <clears throat> Will be done in Q2 of 2022. Sorry, 2023. So where the 2022s and 2023s went? They're on the wrong slides. <clears throat> uh, Loon Lake is to be determined. It's, uh, it's seasonal. It's really, really hard to, to establish a rate there. So the mock bill, it's an example of one on the right. Uh, it's stamp, do not pay. Um, people have even commented, like, that's really nice that we know not to pay this one. So where's the one we have to pay? Because this um, Christmas is January. They did um, four or five communities did not receive a bill to pay for water. They received a mock bill, do not pay, but they were looking for their actual water bills. And that's simply because their flat rate, we were billing for the, th the three months ahead. With our water meter rate, we're billing for the three months behind because we can't <laughs> meter what hasn't been used yet. So... Um, as an example, Del Oro. So the green line represents the flat rate, um, and the blue line represents each of the 35 customers that received a mock bill, what their rate would pay. And that ranges between, uh, their flat rate is $1,200. The, the average for Del Oro was $1,218. So based on our rate modeling and our mock billing, we're eighteen dollars difference from, um, from what we what we thought we'd be at. And the range though is is interesting. This is the equitable equitable billing part in that the blue line also represents consumption for each user. Um, our low was seven hundred sixty eight dollars. So if you don't use a lot of water, you can get a 
basically an incentive um, from paying a $1,200 flat rate down to $768 for our minimum. And our highest user ended up paying, would have paid $2,378. So double what their flat rate would be um, based on water consumption. So it spreads out that it makes it equitable. If you use a lot of water, you pay for it. If you don't use a lot of water, you get a, a not a rebate, but an incentive, you pay less. So uh, Evergreen also looked at this one. And this range is much is much smaller. So Evergreen ranges from $1,128 to $1,832 with the current flat rate being $1,500. Um, and the average actually was $1,451. So we we're $49 away from our flat rate on that with our based on our mod billing and our, our modeling. These are our actuals, our 2022 actual revenue just for the um, water rates versus the mock billing for the water rates. So this does not include parcel taxes. So <clears throat> black pines, the first one, the, the blue is the mock billing, the green is the actuals which black pines was already metered. So we're looking at a new meter, metering structure or rate structure for them. We had a $7,000 difference there. And that um, was interesting because we are, the consumption of black pines was actually 16% higher than what we um, use as a baseline for modeling. So our revenue was only 10% higher than what we used for a baseline. Um, the Trans Mountain pipeline went through there and there was a lot of water used for reclamation of the individual properties. So um, that's can, can explain part of that. Uh, Del Oro, Evergreen, Maple Mission, Wallachine. I mean, Wallachine came in within a few hundred dollars of mock billing versus actuals. Uh, Maple Mission was again $500 within. This is for the community overall. So um, these are the, with the exception of Savannah, we asked, I've estimated the um, Q1 mock billing for Savannah based on the last winter um, quarter. But Savannah being our largest community, uh, $215,000 actuals was within $150 or so, whatever that number is, $162, over, over 290 connections. Um, so our, what we told the residents and the, in the, in the customers in our public meetings is that the goal wasn't to increase the revenue from each individual system. It was to collect the same amount of revenue, but distribute the costs um, appropriately and equitably based on water consumption. So I think this shows a pretty good picture of our ability to do that and the success we've had with that. Now, Spence's Bridge is a different story here. Um, if we had gone on that metered rate right away, we would have come up with a deficit of about $18,000. Um, the only thing I can see on that is it's a very complex um, flat rate system in that we have pieces in there for individual hotel rooms, um, lodging rooms, camp sites. If there's two laundromats, two laundry machines, whatnot, it all affects the flat rate. So it's not just like Evergreen, 16 customers, 19 millimeter meters. They all have the same $1,500 rate. Um, Spence's Bridge has everything from a, a three quarter inch, 19 millimeter meter up to a six inch meter. Um, and there's commercial residential mixed in there as well. So it was a much harder one to, to model and we'll have to make some adjustments on that. Um, so, but overall that's, those are the results of our, our mock billing for our first five systems and the next five systems. So these, these five will be getting their actual bills based on metered usage. Um, this quarter and the other uh, five systems, with these, so not Loon Lake, but the other five will not be getting a flat rate bill um, uh, first week of April at the end of the quarter one, because they'll be getting their last mock bill, um, the fourth quarter mock bill. So that's one of the other reasons I want to go through this is that this is all happening and coming to an end right now. And we're going to a metered rate stuff. And there've been an awful lot of, um, calls from the community members and customers about the mock billing, the flat rates um, and everything else. So late director Grenier mentioned, we have a, a meeting in Savannah on Monday night. I expect to get a lot of questions about this. I was really, really happy to see these results for Savannah. Um, we're, we're spreading the costs equitably amongst the users versus increasing the costs for all the community. 
Um, that being said, we've seen high inflation rates, but that's the next presentation, which we will defer to another day. So that was it for my water metering thing. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to take them. I think given the time, uh, do, do any of the directors have any uh, anything that they want to see uh, discussed at the upcoming meeting or any information that we want to have as directors on our systems so that we can be prepared for that meeting that's going to get scheduled? Uh, what What's your thoughts? Director Houghton? Like with all the different systems that we have in all our different areas, and the different sources of funding we may not or may not have, are we going to kind of prorate where we spend our money that we have available to us to the systems of most need versus most want? Or, you know, because we might have a system in this area that's old and failing needs this, and this one over here can get by for a while. And I'm just curious. How we're going to spread the wealth around and into the different areas and the different systems that need it the most. Yeah, so I guess start that answer and probably Tyrone could fill it in. So part of that goes back to this um, our, our list of policies. So we deciding what to chase for grant funding depends on you know how big the grant is we need to there's a lot of things we need to consider before we bring so ultimately those grant funding applications come to the board to, to say that we want to apply to the board to support applying for x amount of dollars for this grant for an x amount for a specific system so when a grant comes available that's when Tyrone and his team are going to be looking at things like okay, well what are the shelf ready projects what are the conditions of the grant um how much is available um, so it's we we do that, but it's not a straightforward working our way down the list because we don't know what their criteria is. So when the criteria comes out in the amount, then we have to kind of work backwards and try to figure, okay, well, what what project might fit into this? And then we decide from a staff point of view what to recommend up through this committee and, and to the board. Is that uh yeah. that capture that well? Yeah, I think um a little bit more on that, but like um in our strategy or policies as well we have to like our base level of services provide potable water so meaning the 43210 is a top priority so when we are looking at getting grant ready projects we're looking at doing preliminary designs for water plants or exploration for groundwater um that kind of thing that benefits that versus you know water main upgrades for fire flows um and then even on the smaller stuff for instance like gas tax um there the different areas had different allocations and so you know area p has six has six utilities and area j has has one um we for loon lake for instance like a flushing unit eight thousand dollar project for a flushing unit um versus if there's two million dollars available in area p we could almost we could have almost put in a filtration system for 16 connections in evergreen but you know we have to weigh that as well you know best most benefit like loon lake versus evergreen but then you have a pritchard there and a paul lake there and five other utilities that you draw from that so we look at, at projects on the gas tax side that we can that we can manage ourselves to, to for um, efficiencies and cost savings um and for instance infrastructure that we can install ourselves and most commonly what we'll do is these pumps that we have in like paul lake lift station for instance those the the last pump we we took out in 2021 was an original install that has been replaced by two model um, years and so that was an upgrade because that's an obsolete pump you can't actually replace that pump so it's not, now it's an upgrade it's capital eligible right so we we look at those kind of options too so need new pumps for this they're 20 years old okay um and we're running into that in Pritchard where we have non-repairable pumps and so before we come and ask for a bunch of you know money for grants we're looking at is this the best use of that money because it's not infinite right it's a finite amount so is it going to be a benefit so yeah uh alternate director uh sure thank you
Yeah, so that's something for Thursday, Friday this week before we get to it, whether to decide whether or not to. I think it's, sorry, it's probably not even a decision to make. It's a, most likely the best option is to do another set of mock bills and bring a new rate to the board because to increase the rates, we'll have to adjust the bylaw, um, which would require board approval. So I can't just arbitrarily change the rate um, and send it. So, thank you. Yeah. Director Sal, did you have a question? While there's a lull, I just wanted to propose a uh, that that the morning of May the fourth appears to be available for a committee meeting. It's confirmed. It's available. So um, there's a board meeting that afternoon. So suggesting that 10 a.m. on May the fourth could be this committee, or maybe we could do a 9 a.m. Yeah, let's do a 9 a.m. <laughs> we'll we'll uh, let Chelsea know and she'll she'll put it in your calendars if that works. Yeah, okay. So anybody have any problems with that, do you think? Okay, that's great. Thank you. We're going to have uh, I, I, we've got lots of questions, I'm sure. <laughs> well, and if you need to come in the evening before, yeah. you can you can always you can absolutely always do that. Okay, so yeah. nine o'clock start for the. Yeah. For the May fourth meeting, and uh, uh, maybe you come in. Yep. Well, thank you for that comprehensive report, and uh, it's given us a lot to think about to go along with that closed meeting we had. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering to be productive for that nine o'clock meeting. Is there any kind of report that you could circulate to the committee members with a proposed course of action so that we can consider that uh, or anything else? Uh, is that a reasonable request, do you think? Uh, and course of action relating to what specifically, though? Well, You've proposed a whole lot of projects that either don't have funding or need to be done and something is going to fail. So uh, I don't think our options are to sit on our hands. We've got to start making decisions about these things. And I'm just wondering, given that you've put some numbers together, uh, do you want to sit there and say, for instance, on the Savannah system, this is what we would recommend you consider. And this is how much of, you know, you know what our gas tax funds are, you know what our other things are. Perhaps as a recommendation you could make for some of these. So, uh, um, yeah, the the all of the the projects that we're putting forward are what's already built into the master plan identified as need to be done. So, um, I, I, we view those as those are kind of on the list when there's funding opportunities. So, in terms of action from the board, there's no which you'll hear about in the next presentation. There's no money available now, so there's no action. From a funding point of view, to bring to the board, uh, unless unless you know grant funding becomes available. So tomorrow we have a budget meeting, and what what do we take away when we're considering that budget meeting in terms of the things that you've said to us today? So I guess when you're when you're looking at the individual budgets for these systems in your budget meeting, and when and you already have that um, from the agenda last week, um, you'll see what's built into the budget and and what's not. So the to, to, I guess to try summarize and lump them all together, um, the any significant capital project in any of those budgets um, is linked to funding that's coming in. So, for example, the Pritchard budget is very high because we have a water treatment plant that's funded through a grant. But any system that does not have any significant capital also doesn't have any revenue coming in from grant funding. So, the the user fees and and parcel taxes are funding just the base day-to-day -day operation, not addressing the, the capital needs. Yeah. 
uh, Director Hodden. Throughout all our meetings, where will we be discussing where the David E B money will be going or where that money, um, where you folks want it to go or how we're going to handle that? Uh, Director Morris. Thank you. A very simple question. You used the term the first real bills are going to be uh, reaching people. Uh, and it sounded like it was imminent. And it is all I'm asking is ballpark knowing uh, when and whom, as it were. Yeah, so the the real bills, so switching from mock billing um, and away from the flat rate billing to the meter rate billing will happen for Wallachine. Evergreen, Del Oro. And I think that's it for right now. And that will happen for based on Q1 consumption, which is end of this week. Um, so they will see those in April. And then the remaining communities will see, um, would ex should expect to see those in at the end of Q2, beginning of Q3. Here are Okay. Yeah, and I'm not expecting a lot of phone calls based on winter usage per meter. Like, oh, I'm only paying two hundred dollars. So yeah, right now you are. Um, anyways, well, thank you. I think that uh, we'll save the rest of the questions for the next meeting. Uh, thank you very much for the comprehensive meeting, and we'll consider this meeting, this committee, closed. Yeah.